Uh, excuse me. Is anyone speaking? I, I can't hear anything. Hi, the speaker is muted. No sound. Um, can we request that the speaker unmute their microphone for virtual attendees? Cool. 
I think it's, it's splitting screen causes a sort of problem. Let's maybe do it mirroring. Uh, Better. Mirroring how? I mean, it's okay. You can just go. Otherwise, we're going to be very late. Thank you. Uh, let me just. Uh, I. Only one second, because I don't know what my pointer is. Uh, the metro, what is the second screen? I cannot see the pointer. Oh, here, I think I'm here. Okay, okay, good. Sorry, this setup is really complicated. Okay, now it should be back on track. Thank you, and apologies. So yeah, uh, some metrics were uh, heavily saturated very early on this data set. But the most interesting thing is that there was a huge gap between what uh, you would uh, call traditional uh, descriptors and uh, more modern descriptors. And this is a bit surprising. This is something that we saw uh, when I was that I saw when I was working on a paper with uh, a colleague with Quang, uh, of organizer of this workshop. So we were working on Lyft, which became the first paper that was uh, jointly learning uh, the three parts of the classical descriptor, uh, sorry, local feature pipeline, which is the key point detector, the orientation detector, and the descriptor. And uh, what we saw is that uh, we uh, obtained state of the art performance. So will you have a paper? Uh, but at the same time, C++ was doing actually quite well. And many of the supposedly state of the art papers in the middle uh, of these plots were not doing so well. So, you know, the, where does this uh, huge gap that you see between the last evaluation and this evaluation come from? Uh, there's not a lot of data sets that can be actually used to evaluate this in practice. So, for instance, the two data sets that are still kind of in, in uh, use or very much in use one is H patches, which is, uh, it was initially a data set that was meant to also evaluate uh, patch classification performance. Uh, it also published the whole images and that's what's uh, being used mostly nowadays. It has two types of sequences which are showing only illumination changes or only viewpoint changes. It also uses intermediate metrics and um, it has some limitations in the sense of, you know, this is the kind of change that you can expect with these images. It's mostly, it's mostly just a uh, static scene that you see from different viewpoints with a lot of texture or just drastic changes in illumination with uh, no changes in, in viewpoint. Another uh, data set that is still used is the ATH Coma Benchmark, which is interesting in that it's very large scale. It uh, targets structure from motion, but there is no ground truth. So the only thing that you can do is measure uh, reconstruction statistics, such as projection error, or how many points and how many observations they have, right? Which is interesting, but it's not exactly going to tell you which method, which method is better uh, in, uh, in this setting. So our proposal was to try to address this uh, gap or this void with an open challenge. We have run it every year since 2019. Uh, it's the basis of a benchmark that we published. It's available on GitHub and a journal paper in IGCV. Uh, this, I want to say that there's a few more uh, resources now, mostly visualization.net has a number of datasets that can be used and tasks can be used for a real localization. And there are similar evaluations uh, uh, as the one that I'm presenting here on a dataset called Megadeth. Uh, so what is changing uh, on this uh, year's workshop? Uh, this is the first uh, post-pandemic, uh, let's say post-pandemic, in quotes, hybrid format. Uh, CVPR is not providing a lot of support, as we saw now. We had a lot of issues the first uh, 10 minutes. I hope that they are mostly resolved now. Uh, we have uh, seven speakers joining in person and seven joining virtually, so uh, hoping that everything will work out. Um, we have seven workshop papers, which is a lot more than we had in previous editions, and five challenge talks. The schedule is very tight and it's even tighter because we started late. So I'll uh, ask everyone to please uh, save the questions for the end uh, or just ask them on Zoom chat and we'll relate them to the speakers. Um, brief history of the challenge. The 2019 was the first edition and uh, we've had multiple challenges uh, other than the one that I'm mostly talking about, such as Silda and Simulac Match, that was uh, from a colleague who's uh, uh, not been able to organize a challenge this time. So I'll just talk about the other one. In 2019, uh, winners use mostly uh, learned, learned patch descriptors. So basically like SIFT which, uh, with a learned patch descriptor. Uh, in 2020, it was a really nice year, I think, because out of the four winners, we had three that were introducing novel papers, such as Superglue, Adalam, or DISC. So I think that was actually kind of like what we were hoping the, the, the challenge would become. And in 2021, it was a bit different. So instead of trying to uh, 
make it deeper, we just made it wider, and we uh, tripled the number of data sets from one to three. Uh, in the top performance, we're having mostly like more engineered solutions, right? And uh, the challenge got uh, significant, pretty much the same number of submissions, which was okay because it was much shorter due to the overhead in adding all of this data. 2022. Uh, this is something that we wanted to do for a long time, and this year we succeeded. Uh, we moved the challenge to Kaggle, uh, and we actually have a nice prize. So we have $10,000 for the winner. This uh, challenge is sponsored by Google. Uh, we'll have more details uh, at round four. I just wanted to uh, briefly talk about, uh, you know, did it work out? So these are the number of uh, participants and submissions that we had the uh, last three years, which was between uh, 28, 25 teams the past couple of years and about hundred submissions. So this is where we are this year. So obviously it worked quite well. We have about uh, 25 times the number of teams and about 150 times the number of submissions. So that was uh, quite good. A uh, very brief recap about how Kaggle works. We'll talk about it more later, but it's a code competition. So basically just write whatever code you want on a Jupyter notebook on Python, and you uh, submit it on a, submit for offline evaluation on a private test set that you cannot access. Uh, this makes it very difficult to cheat, which is a, problem in this uh, kind of competition because you can get very good posters, which is the, uh, uh, the goal of the competition, but just annotating a few points manually, right? So this is actually a big concern. Uh, it has a fixed compute budget, so you can just do whatever you want for like nine hours, and it allows for quickly iterating with different solutions, which is very nice. It's, uh, it also enabled a lot of different people to participate, so from academia, from industry, and even some complete freelancers and people who had no experience with this kind of problem, which I think is really cool. Uh, cool. At the same time, you know, this was a learning process uh, and uh, we uh, learned some lessons that we'll talk about it if we have time at the end. So uh, this is going to be the schedule again. We'll move on to the invited talks. Uh, so we'll start with um, Tom Malishevich, uh, who's now at Meta. Uh, Tom, can we check if you are here? Can you? Yeah, can, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. But, uh, uh, can you do how to plug the audio for the question? Yes. Uh, Tom, we are trying to figure it out. Give us a minute. OK, no problem. We hear you, but not anyone, not anyone, no one else, I guess, hears you. Uh, how to connect this thing? Okay. Can we just put it here? Say something. All right. Can you guys hear me still? Okay, we have sound output. Input and put output. It's later. Uh, say something now. Okay, how about now? Okay. Uh, is this not... Oh, wait, it's, it's also a separate thing to zoom on. Uh, there is uh, in Zoom. Oh, no, no, it's it. Wait, wait, it's. Uh, yeah. Yes. Try something, Tom. Okay. How is it um, now? I can see the coffee break yes, and poster great. session slide. So it's, does it sound good enough? Yes, it's, it's wait, wait, wait. We can have. Okay, is it maximum? Uh, Tom, continue saying something, please. Okay, yeah, whenever you guys let me know, I have my slides ready to go. So after we pass all the checks, I can begin. I think Tom through the speaker. Yes. Maybe we can look at the speakers, yeah. So you set up the input correctly. So we can mute down and now uh, external headphones, which is okay, external headphones. Do you say something again? 
Okay, how how is it sounding now? No, 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 no. So it's, it's the best we can have. Okay. Oh, there's no speakers, right? I only see. It. There's no speakers. There's nothing. Yes. Okay, so you can oh, share no speakers actually. I don't know. You can share screen. Okay. But it's the sound is uh, I think uh, good, audience, but bad for local audience. Okay, okay, okay. Do you guys see my slides? The... Uh, you, can, you can show it. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. Uh, where is it? Okay, is it is Zoom crashed? Oh, no, 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 so it's here. Here, it's here. And... Ah, it's not. Sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay. Okay, one moment. I think it's, it would be, it was so was, was stupid idea to remove the mirroring. I'll fix this first. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a few minutes, sorry. Yes. Uh, I don't remember who was that guy who advised this, but it was very, very, very bad thing. Uh, great. So it's done. Zoom here. Okay. Not. Okay. Now we can see your screen. No, but there is no good output. So uh, this is the. Uh... Yeah, so this is the output for there. But that doesn't work. That doesn't make any sense. That's not fair. I, I mean, is there any other? Sorry, what? Okay, that's point the mic to the laptop. <laughs> that's a, that's Incredible a idea. <laughs> so, yes, <laughs> MacBook Air speakers. Okay, Tom, say something. Now. Okay, how is the sound working now for you guys? Is Your the sound okay? Mic at, at you. Folks in the chat are saying the sound is good for them. That's in the Zoom chat. Wait, not yet. But there's one to play that one, isn't it? Should work. Okay, say something now. Okay, let's do our, our last check and see how it works so far. It actually works. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, sorry. Again, complicated technology. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Tomasz Milicevic. Uh, Tom has did, did his PhD at Carnegie Mellon under Alia Shaefros and a postdoc at MIT with Antonio Tohrada. In our field, he's very well known for his work at Magic Leap. Uh, he was principal engineer for several years, uh, during which he co-authored two seminal papers in image matching, which is the topic of this workshop that most of you probably know, about, which are super point and super glue. This is what we, he'll be telling us about later today. Uh, and also, these are interestingly some of the uh, methods that are used by almost all of the participants in the challenge. So you know, remains very much in use. He's now at Meta Reality Labs. Uh, Tom? All right. Thanks for the introduction, everyone. Today, I'm here to talk about those two seminal papers, Superpoint and Superglue. But what I will do for the first time is sorry. I'm going to take a look. Um, give, us, give us one second, sorry. We need to fix one thing. No, no, you hear it. Just, just it. Let's press it. Oh, it's mirroring now. Perfect. Yes. So full screen. Yes. How do you full screen? I think that's. 
think this so is that's a... our window. Yeah. Yeah, Mm. I don't know. So why is this for this one session? Standard. Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. Great. Okay. Now we are actually good. Let's go. Apologies. All right. Okay, great. Everybody's saying we can they can hear me fine. People can see me. They can see my slides. Excellent. So the new thing today is going to be I'm going to be highlighting the lessons learned from those two projects. Some of the things we designed at first, some of the surprising things we learned. And I'm going to offer a couple of meta lessons at the end that kind of summarize some of the key strategies. And I want to sort of empower the next generation of researchers to think a little bit outside of the box when they are working on their own key work. As mentioned before, I am now at Meta Reality Labs. I'm a research scientist manager there within the Surreal Group in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area. You will hear today, later, some of the work done by some of the other Meta Reality Labs researchers and interns. Excellent. Yeah, so SuperPoint and SuperGlue are really were given birth to thinking about visual slam, thinking about all day perception, thinking about what it's like to make machines move through space. Autonomous driving, mixed reality, autonomous robots. However, it was mixed reality that was the key application. Uh, the one of wearing glasses that let you see part of the real world, part of the environment around you and adding digital object. That's, so this work here is gonna be work done from my magic leap phase where I was there for five years, as mentioned earlier, a principal um, engineer there. And I will mention some of the key people whose lives I influenced by working on these projects. So today I'm going to give the quick overview of SuperPoint just for comprehensiveness so everybody can come in and uh, participate in this talk without prior knowledge. I will also talk about SuperGlue and what's new is the lessons learned section. I'm going to after SuperPoint mention a couple of lessons about SuperPoint. Same thing with the SuperGlue section. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with the meta lessons learned. And those are designed for young researchers to just be aware of what might happen after their PhD and keep um, their eyes on the bigger prize out there. So yeah, let's take a look at sort of SuperPoint. What is it? What it's sort of all about? Now, when I started my PhD a long time ago, everybody was still talking about SIFT. That was 2005. And I kept thinking, man, if SIFT is so famous, so popular, even decades later, let's, let's keep doing the same recipe. There's something about points matching them that's here to last for a long time. Deep learning was new. Let's design condnets to replace SIFT. We started working with this following paradigm. There's the front end part of Visual Slam and the back end, back end part of Visual Slam. The front end extracts the features, the key interest points, and the back end will do the bundle adjustment and the 3D estimation from the 2D features. SuperPoint is a deep slam front end. At the time that we designed it, we were using a you know, very simple ConvNet. This was still before ResNet. This was a VGG-based backbone. And then we wanted to have multiple heads, one for detecting the key point 2D locations and one for detecting the key point descriptors. This work kind of is simple. It's one of the reasons why the world liked it. We had a hard time publishing this work at the main CVPR venue. We decided that the workshop on Visual Slam, the deep learning for Visual Slam workshop would be good enough. It actually ended up working in our favor that this workshop brought all the deep learning and Visual Slam experts together. We really had an awesome audience to show off this work for the first time. A simple lesson there is if your work doesn't get into the main conference, keep looking for a venue where your work might be received. Don't necessarily abandon something if you believe in it. Yeah, so super point is um, points and descriptors are computed jointly. No patches are extracted. VGG-like backbone. We did design it for real-time processing on a GPU. At the time of creation for SuperPoint, we wanted to keep the backbone lean. 
we were thinking really about running this on a device, on a companion compute device, but not something that would just have academic value by being an overly large and fat network. Yeah, so the front end is going to be the super point and the back end is just something done by a separate algorithm, typically bundle adjustment for doing the full visual slam pipeline. In terms of training super point, there were certain key difficulties and certain key insights and some of the lessons learned are going to come from the how to train super point section. So to set up the training, we use the MS Coco data set of images. We would warp the images using homographies, create correspondences between points. That's going to be a separate network I'll talk about where they came from. Relatively simple, Siamese training, you know, contrastive loss. Everything is pretty textbook at this point. The key question, though, is where do the key points come from? That's not something you can just ask human labelers to label the key points. So these are MS Coco images. And yet if you send them to Amazon Mechanical Turk and tell people to label interest points, they're not gonna come up with something that's necessarily coherent and makes sense. And that's because interest points are an entity created by machine vision researchers for the task of comparing images and matching them. It's just too hard for humans to do. So we followed a self-supervised training recipe. We first started with a synthetic world and we had a synthetic shapes renderer. This is a Python renderer that just generates simple shapes. And then once we train to detect the corners of those simple shapes, then we project everything to MS Coco where there are no interest point labels. And MS Coco has a lot of images, but it's not the kind of data set you would think a visual slam researcher would ever use because these are disconnected snapshots of reality. They're not videos. There is no 3D associated with those images. We had to invent something called homographic adaptation to project from one world to another. But the self-supervised theme, still a very popular one today. I'm glad at that time we saw the promise of self-supervised learning and included this as a first order citizen in that work. So the synthetic training was relatively simple but it involved lots of heavy noise being applied to the images. Here's some examples of what the synthetic training was able to generate for creating that core interest point detector. We had an earlier version of super point that we called magic point, which was just the interest point detection bit. That work we only got out on archive. I do believe we had attempted several times to publish it but it was something that wasn't being received very well. People were like, oh, you're doing something old. This doesn't feel like new research. However, it was a great starting point for us. We did evaluations. It convinced us internally that magic point were much better systems for detecting corners compared to all the classical techniques. Homographic adaptation was then the self-supervised thing we had to invent to get everything working on real images. We start with an unlabeled input image. We do the synthetic warping of the image, generate many different versions, warp under different homographies, run the magic point detector, warp the images back, and then aggregate the points. And we observed we were able to detect a superset of the points as a superset relative to their individual images. That's where the name super point came from, the fact that we could detect a superset of points. Now, 3D generalizability of SuperPoint was something that kind of came out for free. We trained and evaluated on planar scenes, but then when we applied it to video sequences using a simple connect the dots nearest neighbor matching algorithm, we found that it worked surprisingly well on a large diversity of images. In fact, it seemed to work pretty well on just about any application. That's because it was trained on Coco with a lot of noise. It really got to see a very diverse world. This isn't something that just works on Kitty. It doesn't work on other data sets. It worked a little bit everywhere. And that was one of the key things that made the technique successful. People have used SuperPoint in lots of interesting applications, and it's always a great baseline. It's not the easiest to beat, but if you do push on your own system, your own application, you can usually beat it. But SuperPoint is a 
embarrassingly powerful baseline for all point related tasks. So then we released our super point um, at the workshop. That was kind of a big success because the actual release was essentially two files, the pre-trained model in PyTorch and a simple demo script that would show you how to run it. And then OpenCV in Python was doing a lot of the heavy lifting, loading image streams, things like that. But simplicity was key. So let's take a look at some of those lessons learned things that I might have talked to you if we had sort of dinner at a conference together, but not something I would have presented before. Okay, so let's take a look at the first lesson learned. What did not work? So the one thing that didn't work is this whole era of research that we did right before SuperPoint. We tried to use convnets to directly estimate the relative pose between images. That did not work for us. There were key papers, I believe called PoseNet from ICCV 2015 that showed there is some promise in having deep learning convnets just figure out the whole pose problem. But something was fishy when we tried working on this. You know, it was very easy to tell that the convnet could take a look at a pair of images and figure out if the motion is to the left or to the right, or you're going forwards or going backwards. But getting a precise six DOF relative pose was very hard. It really didn't work. We spent kind of a lot of time working there. We eventually had to abandon this direct relative pose estimation. And I came to the realization that convnets were very tied to the image plane. And relative poses are much more high level quantities that describe the configuration of cameras. They're not really tied to an individual set of pixels. So the second lesson was, well, let's leverage what we know already. And I had known quite a lot about object detection from my work on the exemplar SVM on hog based techniques that I had developed during my PhD. Now hog techniques, the formal part models, they seemed like a world long time ago when deep learning came, but it was really only a couple of years after the deep learning revolution happened that we were working on super points. So the key was like, well, object detection can detect objects in the image plane let's build a point detector that detects points much like an object detector would detect objects and then we realize well that's what's going to help us build a super point so the lesson here is you might utilize skills in one domain when you go into a new domain and in this case the new domain was visual slam and the old domain was object detection and it worked quite well to be able to take techniques from one domain and bring them to the other. Third is we used MS Coco for training. And at first we had a lot of resistance from the in-house teams that were collecting their own data at Magic Leap. They said, why don't you use our data that we collected? Well, there were several issues with that data. And ultimately we realized if we used in-house data, it would be hard for us to write a paper about SuperPoint. It would be very difficult for us to release the data set that's created in-house by you know, VC-backed sort of company. The data had a lot of things that needed to be clean. It was great for internal use, but not something we could have ever really disclosed in a paper how we collected that data. And in addition, by using MS Coco, it made SuperPoint work on a more diverse world than we had anticipated. And that's what made the technique last a lot longer time. Now, the benefit of using the public data is that more people trusted the technique, that we could disclose the whole recipe. We, were, we never gave out the synthetic shapes renderer, but people could kind of create their own by looking at a, several example pictures. That's not the most difficult part. So I think this was a decision that at first I wasn't sure was the right one or the wrong one, but many years later, I think it was the right decision. We avoided using an in-house data set that we had concerns with. We used a large scale publicly known data set that made it easier for releasing ultimately the, the paper, describing the technique and convincing the research community that it works. I think that was the right decision at that time 
it was hard to tell when we had to come up with this. And the last lesson learned is that simple synthetic shape renderer that I had described earlier showed some pictures that performed on the fly training data generation using a simple OpenCV renderer in Python, it really helped us get off the ground. It essentially meant that our training scripts did not have to rely on data. So anywhere we had a GPU, we could simply send the Python program. Once it has PyTorch up and running, it's accessing the GPU, it just starts generating training data and we can start debugging the training pipeline. We can start perfecting it. We don't have to worry about, is the data loading slow? Is it fast? Where are the images? Are they allowed to be on this server? Are they allowed to be on that server? All those questions went away. It was a really a great starting point to get our first point detectors up and running off the ground. Now I'm gonna jump into the second part talking about um, that second key paper, the super glue one. Now this paper came out in CVPR 2020, just two years ago, and it was all about matching local features. It was about learning how to solve the correspondence problem. This paper was done by Paul Edward Sarlin, who was an intern at the time in my group. I'm gonna describe in some of the lessons learned, some of the backstory behind Paul that will help convince everybody what really it takes to write a great paper in industry. All right, so let's go into this little section, do a quick brief recap of Superglue before we go into the lessons learned. So the title of the paper was Learning Feature Matching with Graph Neural Networks. Um, and this was done with Paul, who did this work as a part of his master's degree requirements at ETH Zurich. Superglue Super glue is a graph neural network and an optimal transport procedure. As input comes an image pair, the local features, which were mostly super points, also we tried this with SIP also, come in as input. And then the graph neural network alternates between self-attention and cross-attention, letting the features communicate, it does that for many, many layers, and then it ultimately creates matches between the features that goes into a back end optimizer like bundle adjustment to do the estimation of 3D. Now, super glue worked really well for extreme wide baseline matching. It also works in real time on a GPU. We trained separate models for indoor and outdoor tasks. We did a pretty large scale evaluation and that's how we ended up being on the radar for this image matching challenge workshop. And the goal of Superglue is to be better than motion guided matching without any motion model at all. Before we had Superglue up and running, we were using a lot of odometry cues to help match super points. But we found out that we were actually injecting heuristics about motion, about geometry, into our C++ and Python programs. For Superglue, we wanna take a step back and say, let the machine learning system figure out how to do all the hard stuff. Superglue is a graph neural network with attention. And as we know now, attention is a big thing. We were inspired quite a lot by the work on transformers. At the time of Superglue in our local Magic Leap reading group, we spent a lot of time talking about transformers, language models, attention. We were really getting our brains you know, wet with these new ideas. And then Superglue kind of came out of those um, study sessions. So the graph neural network encodes contextual cues and priors, it reasons about the 3D scene. And then the Sinkhorn algorithm solves the partial assignment problem just by creating a co compatibility score matrix and performing alternations of row and column normalization, ultimately outputting a partial assignment. It's a partial assignment because a feature in one image could be not visible in the second image. That's why it's sort of partial, but that's sort of key to make it work in a lot of scenarios. And the key thing to remember here is that superglue requires both sets of local features. 
as input, two images come in. This is quite different than what we were doing with SuperPoint, where a single image comes in, you compute all the features, you can cache them. And then when you have basically a large collection of images, you just do the SuperPoint extraction once, and then you can just match everything. Here, this is, doesn't scale as well with sort of super glue. But in the lessons learned, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this requirement of both sets of local features, what it meant for us and why we decided to go that route. So here are some visualizations of SuperPoint and nearest neighbor on the left showing matches and then SuperPoint and super glue on the right. Higher density of green lines means more correct matches. So on the right, we're seeing more correct matches and fewer mismatches, and mismatches are the red lines. One of the key things here is look at the floor, look at the bathroom floor in the top sequence. The local features, really hard to disambiguate because they're just tiles, but there's something about super glue that's able to allow communication across all the features. It's able to disambiguate those matches by using all the context. That's really the power of the graph neural network. We applied this to outdoor data. We also applied it to indoor data. And in the evaluations, we found that the super glue on top of super point was a lot better than just super point. And when we repeated the same thing with SIFT, we found that adding super glue to SIFT was also better than SIFT. In our scenario, the super point and super glue was better than SIFT and super glue, but there are still certain scenarios where SIFT is sort of amazing. Certain applications, it's hard to move away for, from SIFT, especially if that design decision has been made years ago. But we did see large improvements, very strong empirical results. We also released the demo. Um, people could go ahead and you know, download the pre-trained network and apply it for their own problems. It works relatively fast on a single GPU with today's even beefier GPUs just going to get faster for you. If you go online and download the demo, you can get something, you can just play with something like this. You get the super glue demo where you freeze one image and then you move your webcam around and you can try to break it, try to play with it, see what happens when you turn your lights on and off, try out checkerboard patterns, unique patterns, rotate things around. Really a great kind of demo for yourself, especially if you're starting out, you want to see how an amazing point matching demo would look like. You can just get this really running in, in a few minutes. Yeah, so super glue again, we evaluated it at the you know, image matching local features and beyond challenge. We did a lot of other tasks. We won a lot of prizes at CVPR 2020, different challenges that really helped convince the research community that things were working. This paper had a very strong empirical results. Again, this is something that would not have been possible if Paul had only done a short internship. Paul had a six plus month internship where we knew that the work was going to have to come out as a paper. He's working on his master's. We needed to have strong empirical results. Couldn't be just an idea. Couldn't be just something we think of and we patent. No, it had to be something we convince a broader community of its merits. So let's take a look at some of those super glue lessons learned. And I was just hinting at this. Experienced candidates are key to internship success. In this case, Paul Sarlin had the key background even before starting this internship. And let me tell you some of the key things. First, Paul showed up on my radar because when he started his master's, he had tried to recreate the super point training recipe. And there was a GitHub repo from Paul and his colleague on trying to get super point up and running. In fact, that repository was online a few months before we released our super point actual demo. Their version might have not been as good, but because Paul did that work, he was on my radar. And he also then started his first internship at Magic Leap Zurich, which was not with me in the Silicon Valley group, but that helped him get into the organization. I got a chance to meet him. Then it was very easy to get Paul to move to Silicon Valley, San Francisco area for that longer internship. So all those key works he had done before. 
And we also had to extend the internship just to get this awesome paper out. I'm mentioning this is because some people have unreasonable expectations for what can happen in a three month internship. Again, three months is a very short amount of time. I don't want people to do internships and feel bad if they can't write their super glue like paper. Paul was essentially preparing for the super glue work for about a year or so with all these other internships that super glue experience. So that's a little bit of caution for everybody. Just don't feel bad if you don't get a paper out in a three month industrial internship. And another thing, if you like somebody's work, try to get a GitHub repo of it up and running. Who knows, maybe they'll invite you to do an internship with them. It worked for Paul. I think that's a key thing that he did that just put him on the radar. I encourage everybody to just find those papers they love and build implementations, put them online and see, see what happens. So let's go look at another lesson, moving away from practical systems. Now we decided to move away from this computed descriptors paradigm and we made the input to the network two images. We knew at that time that computationally, this was a lot more expensive to actually do this for image relocalization, one of those loop closure tasks in Visual Slam. Super glue is not really maybe the best way to go if you're building edge devices that have to do a lot of the visual slam. Nevertheless, we decided we're going to go that route. We're going to get an excellent paper out with Paul. We're going to do great science on it, but we might not necessarily be building something that's going to go into our products this year. That was hard for me to sort of swallow and realize that the internship was going to go that route. But look, you have to choose. Are you going to please the engineering forces of your organization? Or are you going to you know, scientifically disseminate something amazing? It's important to not do a little bit of both. You don't want to have a little bit of internal impact and write a little cute paper. It's probably better to have big internal impact, get rehired, think about your career within the company or build an excellent paper where scientifically you get a lot of kudos, a lot of respect, a lot of visibility. So we decided to pivot towards this working on great science route. And about in the middle of that super glue internship, I had realized that's where we we're going. And I said, you know what? There's no looking back. Let's not worry about our engineering friends. Maybe, th maybe this won't fit inside the Magic Leap devices in the near future, but that's okay. Let's just do amazing science. And I think looking back, that was the right decision to make, but it's very specific to the project that you're working on and how far you can get in the middle of the project. So let's now wrap up and look at some of the meta lessons learned. What did I kind of learn as an individual that I can teach you about these projects? So the first one is about reinventing yourself. And I say this because I had to reinvent myself several times after my PhD. And the super point and the super glue are essentially that for me. They're the kind of works that I had to do to convince myself and the world that I could do independent, great scientific work without a PhD advisor. This super point and super glue happened in that decade long chapter after my PhD. As I mentioned, I had done object detection work during my PhD with Alyosha Efros, but he wasn't here for this chapter of my life. And this chapter involved a lot of deep learning. I had to reinvent myself. I had to abandon a small startup I had that invested in pre-deep learning techniques. I had to just say, you know what? This was a small company that was becoming a consulting company. I'd say goodbye to that. You're not scaling. I had to join a VC backed company to be a full time deep learning researcher so that I could learn. I couldn't have a consulting company and be learning deep learning on my nights and weekends. I had to be doing it as a full time job. So I had to join Magic Leap. But then Superpoint and Superglue were those successful chapters that convinced me that that work had significance and will continue on having significance. Don't be afraid to reinvent yourself. You'll have to do it probably every decade. There'll be something new. You'll have to just be humble, learn it, and do it. But it's key to think about who you're going to bring along for this adventure. When you think about your success post-PhD, think about 
helping to create careers. Your post PhD impact will influence the young researchers you work with. Some of the really young people will continue to pursue a PhD. Some will get high tech jobs, but you will feel proud of quote unquote your students, just like when you were a PhD student and you were very proud of your quote unquote first papers, first author papers. So that's gonna shift in the kind of post PhD where the people you influence is gonna be like the papers that you wrote. And the last thing is the more you publish, the more people know of your work. I am really proud of those two chapters of my life, the super point and super glue. I still meet people on a regular basis that know of me because of that work. And we have something exciting to talk about. Still meet surreal interns who know me from that work. And it's just great to have a copy with them and chat. By giving talks, you're going to meet future collaborators, future employees, future employers, et cetera. And it's not always easy to publish papers while in industry. People have to think about lots of reasons. Some key insights you want to hide from competition. Sometimes you'll have data that your algorithms touched that is sensitive and you don't want to uh, release sort of something that from a privacy standpoint, you're going to regret. A lot more to think about when publishing a paper in industry, in my general opinion, is it's worth it, but it's not always possible. Don't think every work you do in industry can and should be published. But I think every one to two years, if you are a researcher in industry, you should still have something nice that you can publish. Um, you can talk about, you can give talks about, just meet other folks. And with that, I think I only took up about 30 minutes today. I want to thank the key people who, you know, as of recently, you know, it's, it was Daniel Detone. He was the first author on the Super Point chapter. Paul Edward Sarlin was the first author on the Super Glue. As of recently, both Daniel and Paul and myself have been at Meta, Paul as an intern, and Daniel and myself as full time researchers. It's been great having meetings again with Daniel and Paul, just like we did in the Magic Leap phase. And even though our companies changed, we still have a great working relationship. I still continue advising Paul as much time as I have. I have regular syncs with Daniel. We continue talking about this deep slam vision, although it looks different now at Surreal, at Reality Labs than it did at Magic Leap. It's still exciting to know that the people whose lives I had a chance to influence are still in the brainstorming room. We still get to tap into our brains, enjoy our conversations. And I look forward to not only seeing where Daniel and Paul end up by having another next generation of young researchers come to my team or the neighboring teams working closely and seeing where those junior scientists can become. And with that, I wanna conclude my talk Thank everybody for listening to my lessons learned on Superpoint and Superglue Talk. And with that, I have a few minutes to take a few couple of questions. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think. It would because it's the same. Okay, it's fine. Uh, could you hear me talk, Tom? Just I can. I can hear. Before that, uh, let me try again. I'll ask a question from the other mic. Can you hear me now, Tom? It's a little slow, but I can hear. Try again. I can just do it from this mic. So we have a question from chat, which is uh, from Richway. Do you think it's possible in the future that we can recover camera pose directly from images by using CNNs or something else without explicit correspondences? I think, I think it is a worthy problem to keep revisiting every few years. Just because I did it in 2015, 2016, which really feels like a long time ago, and if it didn't work for me, it doesn't mean it won't work if somebody else sort of tries it. Certain key problems you have to keep trying. I don't think CNNs are the right thing. 
But I think in today's world, we have so much happening with the vision transformers, a lot of new techniques. I think somewhere in the space of new deep learning techniques, people should try this out again. But they should not not necessarily expect AlexNet, VGG style, kind of old fashioned networks to be the right thing for getting camera poses directly. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Tom. So in the interest of time, since we are running still decently well, since uh, Tom was really fast, thank you, but a bit late, we'll skip, uh, we'll move on to the second speaker. Thank you, Tom. All right, uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Okay, so hello. Um, let me introduce the second speaker. It's Alex Rabalik. He's from Capturing Reality, one of the leading companies in 3D uh, structure promotion and actual asset building. And he is a lead engineer uh, of the, the uh, let's say, flagship product. And I think it's a very nice counterpoint compared to the previous talk, which was about how to do research and science in a company. And here, this is about making a product great. So I think two talks from companies with slight different points. So Alish, uh, Alish is a graduate from the Czech Technical University. And since he uh, finished in both graphics and vision, tried to find a place which would nicely use all the, both these skills. He moved to the company and has been there ever since. So Alish, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just loading mine. This is okay. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Hello, this is large scale 3D reconstruction. As I mentioned, my name is Alej Rabalik. I am a lead developer at Caption Reality, which is part of Epic Games. We are a small company based in Bratislava, Slovakia, and we specialize in 3D reconstruction software. Our main product is called Reality Capture. In this talk, I will cover the successes of deploying Reality Capture at a large scale, the limitation and future challenges of 3D reconstruction in general, and finally, I will cover some research topics and related open problems that are needed to be tackled to overcome these future challenges. Before I start, please understand that while I'll be completely honest about what our software can and cannot do, I cannot give you any specifics on the method used in our software. Okay, let me get rid of this this interface now. Seems like it works. Come on. Okay, so what are the successes? Firstly, we have developed a general application which is evidenced by the range of industries that use it. For example, in architecture, building interiors and exteriors are being scanned for visualization and interior planning. Works of art are being scanned for preservation as well as presentation in virtual museum exhibits. Land is being surveyed from ground and air to create maps and to analyze the terrain the entertainment industry is leveraging our software to do visual effects and to create virtual characters and environments. But it's not just the experts in various industries. Increasingly, 3D reconstruction is being done at home and on budget. And we have to consider these customers going forward. It should be noted that apart from the traditional outputs of 3D reconstructions, that being camera poses and calibration and shape 
typically in the form of the mesh. Our customers require, and we provide, appearance in the form of a color texture map. A significant success is that our processing time scales almost linearly with the amount of input data. As a quick demonstration, I took a publicly available data set and processed it multiple times with a varying amount of input data. As you can see, doubling the amount of input data roughly doubles the processing time. Our customers leverage this scalability to process extremely large data sets. We have seen image counts up to 300,000 input images. We've seen ultra high resolution images up to 151 megapixel. The total pixel count of the project has sometimes exceeded 3 trillion pixels and the output sizes are not negligible either with the output triangle count exceeding 8 billion triangles in some cases. To ensure the performance and scalability, we impose restrictions on the algorithms that we can use. We require that these algorithms are scalable, that is, their asymptotic complexity is linear or almost linear. We cannot guarantee that all of the data fits into memory. Thus, we require that the algorithms are out of core. And we would also like for the algorithms to process the data in as few passes as possible. Ideally, we prefer single pass algorithms. While 3D reconstruction is a very powerful tool, it of course has limitations. In the following, I will discuss some assumptions about the scene we have, which when violated will result in a poor reconstruction. Sorry, skipped one. Firstly, we assume that the scene is static. Nothing in the scene moves. More formally, the scene is subject to a rigid transformation. This is why it is so hard to capture people, animals, and also scenes with moving vegetation, for example. The workaround is to build camera rigs with synchronized shutters effectively taking all the input images at the same time. Of course, this can be very costly. Next, we assume that the surfaces are Lambertian, that is perfectly diffuse. Any surfaces that don't have this property might be reconstructed poorly. This includes smooth plastics, metals, especially polished metals, and so on. The workaround is to use a diffuse scanning spray. This is cheap to do and can be made, can be made at home, but it alters the appearance of the model. Also, we assume that the object is densely covered in features. Again, any surfaces that don't have this property might be reconstructed poorly. This includes plastics, again, blank paper, or for example, uniform empty walls. The most common workaround is to employ 3D laser scanning. Ideally in combination with color images, this is actually something that our software supports but admittedly, it is a very costly solution due to the cost of the actual scanner. Another assumption is that the surfaces are opaque, that is, uh, any transparent or translucent surfaces may fail to reconstruct. The workaround is again to use a scanning spray. 
Summing up, there are many limitations to photogrammetric 3D reconstruction, but the industry has always found a way to work around those limitations. Problem is that these workarounds are time intensive and labor intensive and cannot be applied in every situation. For example, 3D laser scanners have range limits and you wouldn't, you wouldn't spray a precious work of art. Additionally, recall that 3D reconstruction is being done at home and on a budget. These customers can use only some of these solutions. For example, the scanning spray or nose projection you can see in the picture. I argue that removing any of these limitations would make 3D reconstruction much cheaper and easier, especially for the non-expert users. This is going to be my best guess at the future evolution of 3D reconstruction. This is the current state of the capabilities. As you can see, 3D reconstruction at a high level is a decomposition problem. It decomposes the scene into its constituting parts, that being the camera poses and calibration, the shape and appearance here in the form of radiance. To simplify the problem, we have some assumptions about the scene. The first step is not much of a prediction because some softwares already have an initial implementation of this. I expect 3D reconstruction to further decompose radiance into reflectance and illumination. There is a clear distinction between radiance and reflectance. Exitant radiance, which we have been capturing so far, describes the energy that is leaving the surface. Reflectance, on the other hand, describes the ability of the surface to reflect incident energy. This means that reflectance is an intrinsic property of the material, while radiance depends on illumination and on the properties of the material. Assuming a Lambertian reflectance model, both radiance and reflectance uh, can be parameterized by three parameters. One parameter per color channel. This is why we are used to seeing both radiance and reflectance represented as a color texture map. While these two maps are visually similar, there's a key difference in that radiance contains lighting effects, shadows, and also a bit of highlights. This is why the process of computing reflectance based on measurements of radiance is called delighting because these lighting effects are effectively removed. The main use of delighting is relighting by arbitrary illumination, I must add. This we can use to insert objects that have been captured into virtual environments plausibly. It is uh, a common mistake to use a radiance map as if it were a reflectance map. As you can see, the result appears dark. This is because the radiance map contains extra lighting effects, predominantly the shadows. This is why I, this is why I expect 3D reconstruction to capture reflectance, to aid the generation of assets and make them usable out of the box for relighting. Another step that I expect 3D reconstruction to do is to upgrade the reflectance model from Lambertian 
to a physically based one. The motivation is that the customers want to use the generated assets for photorealistic rendering. There are many ways to parameterize, parameterize sorry, reflectance in a physically based manner. The most popular seems to be the Disney principled reflectance. On the left, you can see a simplified variant of this principled reflectance with five parameters. These parameters are the three channel based color, roughness, and metallic, which for most materials is just a binary decision between zero and one. This is what I expect 3D reconstruction to capture, to generate assets for photorealistic rendering again out of the box. Next, I expect 3D reconstruction to tackle some of the challenging surfaces that it could not reconstruct before. I think the motivation is clear here. We're tackling directly the limitations of photogrammetry. Finally, I expect an additional pre-processing step of the images to be introduced, a color correction step. To see why this is necessary, we have to consider that most of the input images provided by users are captured with consumer grade hardware, which has a lot of automatic assistance mechanisms. These include optical enhancements, such as focus, but also linear color enhancement, that being exposure, sensitivity, and white balance. Unfortunately, there are also nonlinear color enhancements, which we call photo finishing. Photo finishing are nonlinear color enhancements designed by the manufacturer of the device to enhance the image, which is expected to become an 8-bit sRGB JPEG image. The actual implementation is proprietary and it varies, the actual behavior that is varies based on the manufacturer, on the camera being used, on the selected capture mode, and even the actual content of the image. For example, does it contain people or not? Or what's the lighting like? There are no metadata uh, with the JPEG image that we can use to decide what kind of photo finishing has been performed. And this is a problem. Luckily, there are many problems where this color nonlinearity can be successfully ignored. We ourselves have been capturing gradients without regard for this. After all, whatever makes the input images look as good as possible makes our output textures look good as well. We were content. Unfortunately, there are many methods that depend on color linearity. For example, white balancing or rebalancing after capture, HDR reconstruction. And I would argue that high quality lighting estimation and material estimation depends on color linearity as well. And since 3D reconstruction aspires to do lighting and material estimation, I believe that 3D reconstruction has to reconstruct or restore color linearity as well. So this is my complete vision of a possible future 3D reconstruction. We can see that the decomposition problem has been extended and all the assumptions about the scene have been relaxed with the exception of the static scene assumption, which I expect to stay. Now, let's have a look at some research problems that might help us tackle these future challenges. 
Firstly, radiometric calibration is a classic problem and is exactly what we need to undo photo finishing and restore color linearity. Technically, we are estimating the camera response function which maps the pixel irradiance to pixel values. We limit ourselves to single image methods because the existing multiple image methods require varying exposure, which we cannot provide. Interesting problems include grayscale color, uh, grayscale image calibration, sorry, which has been achieved before, but not at the quality of color image calibration. Also, we interested in any methods that have varying uh, camera response function for each of the channels. As it stands, all the single image radiometric calibration methods assume that all the color channels share the same camera response function. Lighting estimation is another interesting problem. It has become popular lately due to its applications in mobile AR, namely real-time object insertion and relighting. Thanks to that, we now have performance methods that operate on a single image. Interesting problems include, we would like to see more methods that uh, are general, not specific to indoor and outdoor scenes. This is understandable since indoor and outdoor scenes have wildly different characteristics of light. We would also like to use the data that we have available in 3D reconstruction, that is, we have multiple views and we know the shape. Predictably, neural fields are also of interest. These approaches, primarily based on nerve, have been shown to surpass photogrammetry in appearance acquisition of challenging surfaces, such as featureless, highly specular, and partially transparent surfaces, as well as volumes and hair. This is interesting to us because it directly tackles our limitations. Open problems are many, but what's interesting for us is mesh generation. This is because the industry will continue to use the mesh as the surface representation for years to come. And we need a good mesh generation method to satisfy that. Reflectance estimation is also something we are interested in. Specifically, we are interested in a physically based parametrization, ideally the five parametric principled reflectance that I have introduced. There are many possible approaches to this, including running neural networks on each of the input images, doing differentiable rendering to optimize a classical scene representation. Also, there are nerve-based methods that directly estimate these five parameters, such as the one I have figure four here on the right. What we see as the main problem is comparing these methods because there is a distinct lack of data sets. You see what we need is data sets annotated with reflectance. There are synthetic data sets that provide this. Pictured on the right is a synthetic data set generator called Open Rooms. Efficiently capturing at a large scale real world data sets is, however, problematic. This is because precisely capturing reflectance is an involved, time consuming process that requires specialized equipment. 
to amuse you, I have prepared some examples. On the left, you can see a gonium photometer that captures precise reflectance at a point in a laboratory environment. On the right, you can see a portable device called a light drum that can be positioned onto walls and floors, for, for example, to capture reflectance texture in a small patch. Another interesting topic is object completion. We have the problem that reconstructed models often lack details in small areas that were visible by just one camera, or perhaps none at all, completely unseen surfaces. Needless to say, these aren't reconstructed uh, too well. So what we need to do is to hallucinate the missing parts and complete the object. One of the final topics is texture post-processing. We would like to apply image space methods, which are mature. There's a large body of work and they are successful at what they do. We would also like to avoid processing each of the input images separate, separately, augmenting them, and then trying to merge the result into a texture. In contrast, we would like to process just the texture, just once. This would open many applications, such as sharpening, upscaling, and in painting the texture. There are two main interesting problems from our viewpoint. Firstly, is efficiently generating local patches around a texel. Seams in the texture, of course, has to have to be considered. So this leads to some efficient local parametrizations. Secondly, it remains to be seen if there is a way to apply global methods, that is methods that require access to the entire image. You see, there is no straightforward way to have an entire image when it comes to textures. Last but not least, I would also like to stress that we have always been and always will be interested uh, in one of the core problems of 3D construction, which is image matching. Specifically, we are interested in wide baseline matching. Any advancements in matching of unordered image sets and matching that is scalable to tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of images. With that, let me conclude. We have seen that 3D reconstruction is generally applicable and scalable, but has many limitations. Firstly, it cannot handle challenging surfaces, such as featureless, specular, or transparent surfaces. Secondly, it cannot produce assets for photorealistic rendering out of the box. To overcome these limitations, we have a variety of open problems that must be tackled. For anyone interested in jobs at capturing reality, please contact the email that is on the screen. And with that, thank you for having me and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from Zoom. So it's from uh, Henry Kang. And he says that he likes reality capture. However, he wants to know if there is any plan for improvement on poor images. Because the problems in structure from motion is that it always requires high resolution images. Poor images, I see. Well, I promised I wouldn't comment what, about the specifics of the methods, but yes, poor images are always uh, an issue. But our standpoint is mostly that 
the customers take a lot of images and rather than fixing the poor images, our approach will always rather be to remove the poor viewpoints rather than fix, uh, rather than fix them and include them. Hopefully that answered the question. Actually, uh, I have a similar question, but like, well, well, can you comment between having like a little number of high resolution image versus like video, which have like a lot of images, but like lower resolution, maybe blurred and so on? Yes. So what are the advantages of um, having many low resolution images? against having few high resolution images. From my experience, having high resolution images, although not that numerous, is advantageous. This is because we can use a stereo pair of a high resolution image, image to create much more detailed shape. Thank you. I have one question myself, which is uh, I'm in industry now, but I come from academia and I'm still, you know, very close with uh, all of these new papers that come out all the time. And I would like to know how, how do you approach this? Do you actually like look at papers that come out? Do you try them? Do you adopt them maybe? So you're interested in the actual process of uh, applying science at our company. Mm -hmm. Yes, we study papers and we try to apply them ourselves. But as I mentioned, we are a really small company. There's about 12 active engineers. And with our large scale application being used by this many users, we have our hands quite short. So actually there's very few time to try a method. That unfortunately means that when we go and venture to try a method, that uh, we have to be doubly sure that is going to work in advance. There is very little room for experimentation. Thank you for that talk. Can we send the speaker? So we'll have a coffee break now. Uh, okay. Can you go back to the slide? Just yeah. so that we have the, the numbers on the course, the other ones. So uh, we are actually under time. Let me put this quite nice. Videos and slides. So Please come back by three if you would like to attend the second session. And now we'll have a poster session. Uh, can you open the slides? No, not the slides, the, the Google slides. Oh, Google slides. Oh, so Our Google slides, just so that they have the number. Yes, yes, yes. So... I didn't your question. Sorry. Why? It's okay. Just making fun of it. So you mean this? Yeah, this. Uh, I'll show you go to down, 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 down. To the coffee thing. Uh, I just wanted to open this before. No, it doesn't. It's this one. Looking for this one. Okay, we can maximize it. Here. Okay, that's what the CDPR told us. I don't know. We can go and check it out now. They should be there. I thought. I mean, it's not the same. They need to allow. Uh, is it okay if I move my laptop here side by side? Yeah, that's fine. It's perfectly fine. Uh, I mean, I'm the first one, so I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, come here and check our after uses, please.
uh, so, just I, I just, uh, have you guys seen? I think you downloaded them. Maybe. Yes. I just want to check that they are slides. With me, so. uh, but uh, one mention. I mean,
Please resume recording. There is sound. Cool. But actually, we don't have a whole. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, but if you stay, if you start, we can start. Yeah, we can start with this one, and hopefully Daniel will show up. Okay, so we your rounds. Uh, okay, we resume our workshop uh, with uh, paper presentation and to uh, like please keep uh, questions like to send uh, and the talk. And uh, so, so here is uh, first speaker from Amazon. So yeah, that's.
just a slight one. Dude, are you looking for the cursor? <laughs> what? I wanted to, to make this like smaller. But... What do you mean smaller? I mean, uh, slide this uh, thing separated. I, I have no idea how oh, to okay. do it's this. Okay. No, it's okay. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Alin Popa, and uh, today I'll be presenting you our work entitled Unstructured Object Matching Using Co-Salient Region Segmentation. This is joint work with my colleagues, Ioana Sabina Soyan, Ioannis Katarin Santo, and Daniel Voina. Uh, we are tackling a new problem, that of unstructured object matching. Uh, this initially derived from a uh, uh, compliance-related use case. So part of the automated product check pipeline is to ensure whether uh, a product or, a or an object uh, depicted inside the catalog matches the product uh, from the regulatory documents describing it. So visualization of this process can be observed here. Uh, we are dealing with an inflatable pillow. And it is visible that on the catalog side, we are dealing with advertising related content where the, the background is emphasized or different interacting objects with, uh, with our object of interest, such as the case for the pool and uh, the children. So the focus doesn't drop on the, the main object. And on the document side, we have safety and regulatory aspects of the object, which are emphasized. However, the, the most difficult aspect that we encountered and uh, we, why we designed this, uh, this method is that there is no geometric or structure to rely upon in order to apply uh, algorithms or matching algorithms which are based on structural key point correspondences. Uh, here are a couple of uh, image pairs illustrating our targeted use case and emphasizing the difficulty of the proposed task. Uh, in our case, we mostly dealt with objects which were designed for children, such as toys, uh, clothing, uh, Lego sets. And for example, you can see in the right upper corner a uh, costume. Uh, which in one image is dressed, a children is dressed with it, and the, the other is neatly folded on a table. Uh, uh, for this purpose, we collected our own data set, which we entitled Toys in Context, uh, TIC data set, and basically we selected products from the catalog which uh, fall under the toys category. Uh, we downloaded all the co corresponding images for each product, and in total we had like roughly 2,600 unique objects. Here are a sample of objects, the teddy bear and the Lego set, and their corresponding object uh, images. And during the labeling process, we asked the labeler to assign a match or non-match to each image pair. And if there uh, is a matching region, to draw a segmentation mask around both from each image. So in total, we ended up with 13,000, roughly 13,000 images, pairs of images, with a 50-50 ratio between the two. Here are um, illustrations of pairs of matching objects from TIC dataset. And each pair is highlighted using a green bounding box. And I also wanted to emphasize the, the difficulty of the task and the lack of structure between both images. So in the following, I will provide like a high overview regarding our proposed framework and the involved components, uh, followed by an in-depth technical analysis with, with intuition of why we did certain choices. So the way we approached this task was for an uh, input pair of images, IA and IB, to first compute a correlated uh, image embedding representation. Next, we retrieve these similar regions from both images via segmentation task through MA and MB, which either depict the same semantic class or regions with the, the same appearance. Uh, lastly, we use a binary classifier to decide if there indeed exists a match or not between the two. So as fundamental computational blocks for our framework, we have the, the coder and the matcher, which are, which are our um, contribution to this work, and I will uh, emphasize them in the following. So the coder component was inspired from the encoding part of the UNET segmentation framework introduced in 2015. We use basically successive computational blocks denoted with Psi with a separate branch for each image. The difference with respect to the original UNET architecture is that at each downsampling step, we merge the, the resulted signal. 
So the, the entire intuition behind this uh, decision was to constrain the semantically similar regions of both images to have the same feature representation by leveraging this mixed signal strategy. Uh, having feature maps, resulting feature maps FA and FB from the previous step, the coder, we combine them together to obtain cost salient region segmentation of both images. And this is achieved via two segmentation heads, sigma A, sigma B, which produce, a uh, which produce two segmentation masks and are penalized by a cross entropy segmentation loss. And having these masks, MA and MB, we retrieve the foreground regions uh, for the region embeddings RA and RB. Uh, lastly, we have the, the final component, the matcher, and it receives as input the previously masked uh, foreground region embeddings RA and RB. This might have different dimensionality according to the segmented objects. And the, the main concept is to construct a, a tensor with all the possible pairings between RA and RB, which is then weighted by the similarity matrix S between the two. For S, uh, as a metric, uh, sim, uh, as a similarity metric, we use the cosine similarity, proving superior results over the L1 and L2 metrics. And finally, using a classifier head phi, we obtain the, the final matching decision for the inputted image pair IA and IB. So as evaluation metric, uh, we report the precision recall and F1 for the matching class of objects. Uh, given the fact that the problem was introduced was novel, I mean, it is a novel problem, we couldn't find any directly suitable methods to to apply to our use case. Thus we considered um, applying two flagship methods for image matching like ORB and SuperGlue introduced as CVPR 2020 and presented earlier. Uh, both methods rely on structural key point correspondences across pairs of images. Thus we do not expect them to, to perform at uh, high standards. And as a result, we, we have uh, an F1 score performance of 67 and 68% respectively. And additionally, uh, we performed several ablation study demonstrating the impact and usefulness of the uh, design choices we made with coder and matcher in the sense that as an alternative for coder, we use a Siamese ResNet 50 architecture. And uh, for matcher, instead of using this whole heuristic with uh, feature pairing, we use a simple pooling operator first over the entire image embedding, FA and FB, and then over the cost salient region embeddings. Um, as you can see, the worst performing method involves the embedding over the entire image with a 46% F1 score. And we associated this to the fact that uh, the background encoded a lot of noise. And the best performing one is Scott with Matcher. However, the ResNet 50 Siamese backbone also performs like on similar terms. Um, here are a couple of matching results and their corresponding segmentations. So we have grouped them by three columns and on each column we have like on the first row, the input image, uh, the original RGB, the segmented masks. And I want to emphasize a failure case here in the left uh, upper corner. Uh, you can, I mean, we have um, a matching between two costumes and additionally, the segmentation highlights an, a costume with similar appearance. And this usually might to, to induce confusion during the, the matching process. Uh, to conclude, we have presented the novel match niched matching uh, use case of objects with unstructured geometry. We proposed a baseline in the form of a matching frame or leveraging cost salient region segmentation. Uh, and lastly, we provide competitive results over other strong baselines uh, using key point based feature correspondence. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the speaker? Okay. Uh, then I just had one, which is uh, so you tried uh, local features as a baseline. Yes. Uh, to me, like a classification algorithm of some sort would seem a more like logical baseline. 
Did you try that and did it do worse than this? Yeah, it, we tried that and it did worse than this. I mean, we, we tried a lot of other experiments, but uh -huh. just we synthesized the, the ones with the most relevant scope. Okay, so I think it's yeah. actually interesting to have that baseline, but uh, I, yeah. as long yeah, as yeah, you yeah. tell me that it's kind of worse than that, I think, because if you read the paper, that's kind of like what shouts at you, right? But thank okay. you. Uh, let's move on to the second speaker. Daniel, are you around? We can do it from here. Yeah. So the next speaker is Daniel Vadon, uh, who you uh, should know about since Tom uh, talked a lot about uh, their joint work. Uh, he's now at Meta, and uh, the talk is about nerve falls, renderable neural codes for improved camera pose estimation. Great. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction. Um, as Ed said, I'm Daniel Latone, and I'll be presenting some work I did with uh, collaborators over the last year or so. This work was led primarily by Gil Abraham, who uh, did an internship with us. And um, yeah, cool. So let me just move this. So thinking about image matching and localization, to me, there are two key styles of, of image matching and localization that come to mind. The first is indirect and sparse. So the key strategy here is we extract primitives from images, uh, we match them, and we use some sort of reprojection error to drive a uh, pose optimization uh, process. Um, and you know, you've probably heard of lots of methods discussed today, SIFT, D2Net, Superglue. Um, this, is, this is also the core mechanism that's used in systems like Colmap, OrbSlam, et cetera. Um, and one really nice thing about this style of optimization is the ability to do wide baseline post estimation. Basically, as long as you can extract points and match them across wide viewpoints, then you can use this to drive a lot of really challenging image matching problems. This is additionally really nice because it has a lightweight memory footprint. Um, if you want to, for example, scale this up to map uh, an entire city, it's pretty clear on, on how you could do something like that. Uh, one limitation with these types of methods is that they rely quite heavily on having precise sub-pixel repeatable detection. Basically, any areas you have in detection are going to be seen later in the pipeline in your pose estimation system. And so you oftentimes have to make this really hard decision up front. That's a discriminative decision, and you're more or less stuck with it later on. There's another class of techniques that rely more on dense alignment. So using all the pixels to drive the pose estimate estimation problem, um, typically using a Lucas, Lucas Canade style alignment. Uh, works like DTAM, PixLock, IMAP, lots and lots of works have this fundamental alignment at, at its core. Um, this is nice because it uses a lot more image information, which means that you can get a lot of subpixel precision. Uh, one limitation of this is that you know oftentimes you'll require a dense map representation, um, which might be prohibitive for AR and robotics applications. Additionally, they require a good initial pose. So one of the thoughts we had in going about this research is how can we get more out of points? And some of our work was inspired by surfles. So for those of you that don't know, surfles is a uh, rendering primitive used in graphics over the last 20 years uh, that essentially treats each geometric primitive as a, a disk. So you define a 3D point in space and you have a disk that's typically tangent to some surface. And so our idea was, well, can we treat points as being locally dense? And in the end, set up a joint sparse and dense optimization. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. So, um, so going about this, we thought, well, we could use these disks and we could approximate the scene with planar patches, but can we go beyond disks? And so a lot of our work was inspired by the, a lot of the, influ the new work happening with NERF and neural radiance fields, which 
do a great job of being able to render uh, three points and 3D scenes from 360 degrees. So one of the nice things about this framework is that it allows us to uh, render patches around each point that, um, that um, for, for non-planar scenes, because we know that points get, are detected and fire on a variety of different types of scenes, not just planar scenes. And we thought, well, maybe we can have, instead of a single nerf represent the entire scene, have a single nerf that is code conditioned. So, there, in, um, so in addition to having a uh, 3D, uh, hold on, someone's, that's a bit of a call. Should I mute it or no? Uh, yeah, if you could mute in the background, that'd be great. Um, and so, so yeah, that was kind of the, the thinking behind this work. So let me see if this video works, hopefully. Yes. Cool. So here's a visualization of them. So what you're going to see, and I'm going to freeze the frame just for a second so I can explain it. Let's see. So on the left-hand side, you see the RGB image. And um, well, I can't really, when I pause it, it turns black, but I'll just repeat it. So on the left-hand side, we see an RGB image. We see these are super points. We run a super point detector and we filter them quite a bit. So we have only maybe 10 or 20, maybe 30 detected per image. And for each point, we attach this neural renderable code. And so what you see in the middle column are just those codes being re-rendered back into the image. And on the right-hand side, we overlay the nerfles being rendered back onto the original image. The idea is that on the right, you shouldn't really be able to see a difference between um, what's being rendered at the patchwise level by the neural radiance fields and what's being seen on the image. And so the key idea is, well, if around each point you can attach this neural radiance field, we can optimize jointly the geometric error, which is the reprojection error, and a local photometric error. And so that's, that's where NERFLS comes in. So in NERFLS, we represent the scene not only with a point, but we attach a code to each point, as well as a pose. In this case, the pose is pretty simple. It's just a, a three DOF orientation. And the code is a 64 dimensional vector that's input into a, a NERF model. So uh, the task that we use to evaluate the NERFLS is two view pose estimation. So in this case, we have a query, a reference, a reference image, and we want to estimate the relative pose between the two images. So how does localization with this code condition nerf work? So um, in order to do localization, we solve a joint optimization problem. So you see the blue array uh, picture, that's our high dimensional code. We have this neural radiance field, and uh, this neural radiance field will be basically get us what you see this rendered 3D map primitive. So we have a local appearance of that point. And since we know the assignment from a matching stage, let's say we used super point detector or descriptor or your favorite matcher, um, then we can basically first run the geometric optimization and then refine it and get it really precise using this local uh, photometric error. And on the left is just kind of for fun, but we are in, interpolating through the uh, through this high dimensional um, NERFL code space. In this particular model that we trained, we, the, the images were a bit dark, so they, it comes out to look looking like this black coal, kind of a little bit of a mess, but it looked, I think it still looks really cool just to see it um, the, interpolate through these different shapes and appearances. And so, um, so going to a little bit of more, more detail on how this pose estimation system works is step one, extract key points and descriptors, match them. So you see the red lines, it's like standard um, sparse map uh, style optimization. Step two is we optimize for the codes of the NERFL. So um, we just set up an optimization problem where we refine that code. Um, just basically to uh, render uh, a low photometric error in our query and reference frame. And then lastly, uh, we combine these two errors. Again, we have the reprojection error and the photometric error into a joint estimation problem where, um, where we're optimizing over the camera pose and we refine the, the NERFL code a little bit too. 
And looking at results, so we evaluated this on ScanNet where we selected um, essentially pairs of images with overlap. And we show that you can add this idea of NERFLs to a variety of input features. So we tested SIFT D2Net SuperPoint um, to see the, the bolder numbers indicate that we get a little bit of a boost in performance. You'll note that the this approach that gets the biggest boost in performance is SuperPoint because in SuperPoint, um, there really isn't a lot of subpixel localization. There are ways you can do it, but the vanilla SuperPoint doesn't have that. So you really see this NERFLs method shine um, for key points that have struggle a little bit with key point localization. And we also compared it to having just a dense representation of the scene with iNERF, um, which uh, if you just try to train that vanilla, it basically fails because the scenes can be too big. Because um, iNERF a lot of times was designed for uh, object scanning style data sets rather than indoor rooms and scenes. And then the last baseline is what, what happens if we just use a surfhole, basically a planar approximation of the surface, um, rather than having the uh, neural radiance field, which can, can be more flexible. Um, so yeah, this is a fun project. I think a couple limitations, uh, scalability. So um, each, each model uh, has one nerf per scene. So I think as of now, from when we started this work to now, there's been a lot of explosion of work around nerf. So I think there's lots of awesome ideas on how we could improve scalability. Um, rendering speed, this takes about a minute or more to uh, estimate the camera pose, so it's quite slow. But there's lots of work now in, in speeding up nerf. And lastly, in terms of the optimizer, we used a simple first order optimizer, but second order one like Levenberg Marquat should, should be a lot faster. And that's essentially it. So in summary, NERFLs is a way to augment 3D points using a 64 dimensional rendering code and pose. This can be added to any existing local feature. And in the end, what we're left with is a locally dense, but globally sparse 3D map representation. Thank you. Does anyone have a question for that now? Yeah, that's, you basically cut to the core of why this is important. I think, like I said at the beginning, if you have errors in your detector that mean the point is just not really quite where it needs to be, um, then this local optimization has more information coming into the optimization problem. And it can kind of adjust and fix to fix those little problems that can happen in detection, so. Yeah, so SIF, for example, does have some pixel localization and it works quite well. But one of the things you'll notice is as you go up in the semantic space of what you're detecting, it becomes harder and harder to put a very precise point. Like, for example, a chair detector. Like, you ask a human to pick one point that represents the chair that has subpixel repeatability from all views, it's, it's really, really hard. So, I think as, as we want to incorporate more and more semantics into our 3D representation, having this photometric style optimization is one way to account for errors that might have happened in that process. And so we'll move to the next talk. So the next talk is also from Meta. It's a picture of Networks by Hugo Jarnet from Paul Lupin. Uh, did you finish already? Yeah, okay, actually, yeah so yeah. now it's time to share my Go on. It's to be excluded. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, very excited to be presenting the work I did uh, in a previous internship at uh, Meta Creative Labs. Uh, so, this work was done by in, a, in the supervision of uh, Vasilios uh, Mantas and it's called Feature Query Networks, uh, New Source Description for Camera Pose Refinement. So the motivation for this uh, paper was that uh, stemmed from the observation that uh, having truly viewpoint invariant uh, feature descriptors is, is quite tricky. Like it's very hard to obtain uh, 
descriptors that will remain completely invariant to common perturbations uh, uh, that you can encounter in natural images when you have different camera uh, poses. Uh, so one example is like maybe this uh, bottom row here where you have you know, strong out of plane rotations. Um, it's very common that learned descriptors and also more, more traditional handcrafted descriptors will have trouble uh, uh, you know, remaining invariant. And so this is on the right uh, column, you can see, for instance, a uh, correlation map that were obtained uh, by extracting first a uh, sparse descriptor. So a descriptor at the uh, point in red on the reference image, which you can imagine is the reproduction of a 3D point uh, and, and, and computing a, a feature correlation map with the dense representation from uh, the query image on the right. Uh, and the same goes for the for the upper row where we have uh, occlusion, which is even more challenging uh, and is something that was commonly encountered uh, in, in, in many uh, computer vision applications. So instead of trying to achieve uh, true viewpoint invariance, one uh, of, like the idea of, of this paper basically was to try and instead model the variance, uh, basically the view dependent effects uh, directly in the scripture space. So to do that, we introduce a feature query networks or FQNs for short. So FQNs are basically ray-based MLPs uh, that are trained to model the view-dependent effects that you will obtain in arbitrary uh, um, feature descriptors, basically. So um, this is basically a simple model that will take as input uh, known geometry uh, from 3D geometry from what we've been seeing, uh, a camera pose as well, and uh, will be trained to output um, uh, high-dimensional descriptors. So in our experiments, descriptors range from like 128 to 512 uh, channels. So uh, if you compare that to a model like NERF, for instance, it's, it's a bit easier because we only, uh, we assume the geometry is known. So we only uh, query uh, the model at known three uh, coordinate locations and don't try to estimate the density. But on the other hand, we have a much harder task, which is to regress really high dimensional descriptors, which are uh, quite complex. So the way we parameterize this model is as follows. Uh, the FQN will take as input a 3D uh, uh, point, so 3D point coordinate that will um, maybe come from uh, 3D data from like SFM model or uh, a dense, uh, sorry, a depth uh, sensor if you're an indoor scenario, for instance, um, as well as a viewing direction that encodes uh, sort of the, the, the pose uh, of the camera. Uh, the ray length helps uh, uh, modeling the changes in scale and the proximity of your camera with or certain uh, objects. Uh, then, and, then, and then we have some uh, the camera roll and the focal length to encode some of the more planar uh, transformations uh, that can lead to perturbations in uh, descriptors. So if we uh, take this model and train it with, uh, in, the, in that uh, case, D2Net uh, as a supervision on a given scene, so uh, then we can basically overfit it and, uh, and, and at test time, uh, so assuming that we know the, the pose of the query image, uh, we can regress the descriptors from that novel viewpoint. So basically what we do is sort of a novel view uh, synthesis directly in the, in, in the descriptor space. And what this does is uh, that it enables us to basically uh, hallucinate descriptors from, from these novel uh, camera uh, viewpoints and, and bridge this uh, viewpoint discrepancy gap that we have uh, between the reference image and the query image, and that leads to much better results, as you, as you can see. So we derived two applications from the FQN for camera pose estimation. The first one is uh, FQN-based direct alignment. So if you look at uh, the like traditional uh, feature metric minimization uh, formulation, uh, basically you try to minimize the distance between a descriptor of the uh, is assigned to your 3D point and a dense feature map uh, that is computed from your query image that you want to uh, relocalize and estimate the camera pose for. Uh, and the problem is that this 3D descriptor, again, uh, maybe has been computed from a reference image that, was, uh, that had a, a camera pose that was really very different from your query image. And so you have this, this uh, viewpoint discrepancy that can perturb um, the, the, this minimization procedure. So now that we have the FQN, we can uh, reformulate this uh, minimization problem. And uh, instead of having a fixed 3D descriptor, we can dynamically query it to update, uh, to update itself basically based on the current estimate of the camera pose. And that helps uh, avoiding getting stuck in some of the local minimum. 
So we have a, a number of quantitative experiments in our paper, uh, where we show basically that this helps uh, slightly improve the performance uh, of certain descriptors. And, and, and more importantly, that if we take a very uh, uh, simple uh, descriptor that, uh, so in our case, we take a mobile net V2 uh, backbone and, and train it with a simple contrastive loss, we see that we are able to achieve performance that is on par with some of the most advanced uh, uh, relocalization methods like PixLock, for instance. Um, just by the fact that we have learned to model how this uh, this uh, descriptor uh, changes uh, with respect to camera process using f -current. A second uh, application that we derived is what we call this iterative uh, PNP plus one sack. So the idea here is that uh, if you follow a traditional uh, structure-based relocalization algorithm, uh, you can basically learn, uh, so you can basically uh, first compute 2D to 3D key point matches, feed that to a PNP plus one sack algorithm and have an initial camera plus estimate. But now that we have an, uh, an FQN that is trained on a, a, a given scene, we can close this loop and take that uh, camera plus estimate that we have to, uh, to basically uh, uh, re-update the 3D descriptors at this uh, estimated camera pose, recompute the 2D to 3D correspondences and, and solve for the camera pose again. And so we can iterate like this a couple of times and we show that uh, this helps again uh, bridge, uh, sorry, bridge some of the viewpoint discrepancies uh, that, that we have and improve the camera pose estimates uh, in the end. So this is a visual, uh, so qualitative uh, visualization of, of, of this. So basically on the top, you have the reference image uh, with the uh, projection of the 3D points uh, in red. On the right is the query image with the uh, estimated correspondences. Uh, sorry, the reprojection of the points at the estimated camera pose. Uh, and you can see that uh, after a couple of iterations, uh, we, we managed to uh, improve the, the, the camera pose by uh, updating the 3D descriptors and, and recomputing the key point matches and solving for the PNP plus one sec. Um, yeah, so, so that's basically it. The, so we, in this presentation, uh, just introduced this, this concept of the feature query networks uh, that uh, can be used in, in, in two uh, computer vision, uh, oh, sorry, uh, camera pose estimation uh, applications. Uh, it's still uh, limited in, in a number of different ways. It's, it's a scene specific model that is trained on a given uh, descriptor. So there's probably a lot of room for uh, improvement from that. Uh, but uh, we believe this, uh, this is a, an interesting way of, of uh, bridging a viewpoint discrepancy gap and could also be a, a train to uh, model uh, other types of uh, perturbation in the scriptures other than viewpoints, uh, such as illumination or whatnot. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, I have a question actually. So, how how is it like dependent on the uh, viewpoint distribution in the training set, or you like synthesize new, or like how it works if you have like quite limited thing? Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good question. So, I think it's definitely helps to have more camera poses uh, because hallucinating uh, uh, so regressing a descriptor from a completely novel viewpoint that is sort of out of the distribution. Uh, would most likely not work i think uh, it's it's a bit uh, uh i think there's there's that there needs to be a lot more experiments because right now uh, uh even on the size of the descriptors or or other types of parameters uh, that, that i didn't have time to to do during this internship uh but uh but yeah i, th I think it's, it definitely helps to have, to have more uh, sample denser sampling of, of the reference images uh, to model things like the occlusion that i showed right now. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, the next speaker is not here, and I can also explain a, a video that he sent us. It's a minute. So the next talk, which is pre recorded, is learning a segmentation by segment swapping for retrieval and discovery by Shishan and co-authors, uh, Shishan is a PhD student and the code of no, That's coming from the, oh. one second. The audio is coming to the projector. But it should come out of this. Did it change something? No, I haven't. Comes to the speakers. Yes, speakers. Speakers. I can 
move the mic to the speakers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Try. In the code segmentation problem, which aims at finding repeated visual details in a pair of images. The problem can be formulated to have a binary mask prediction for each single image, where unmasked regions are repeated patterns. One example of a pair of images is shown in this slide. We use the transparency to highlight repeated patterns. As we want to learn a model to give us such prediction, the main challenge to solve this task is that there is no training data available to train the model. In this work, we propose a solution including training data generation and architectures to address the problem. Here is the plan of this talk. I will start with our key idea, code segmentation by segment swapping. Then I will show that our approach can be applied to image retrieval tasks. In the third section, I will show that our approach can be used to conduct discovery and code segmentation or collection of images. Finally, I will conclude and give a brief summary to our work. Okay, let me first present our approach. Our key idea is to generate synthetic training pairs with duplicated patterns, which allows learning code segmentation. Precisely, we take annotated segments from Coco and randomly sample a background image. If we directly copy paste the selected segments, the generated image has obvious artifacts. Network can easily support segments through some simple clues, such as the gradient of the boundary. While this information cannot be generalized well on real testing cases. To alleviate the artifact, we propose to leverage Boisson blending and style transfer on the generated image, which leads to pairs that are more natural on the boundary and potentially harder for the network. Finally, our blending will generate a pair of images containing repeated segments. As a result, we also have access to the mask annotations and the correspondences of the segments. Here are some generated pairs. We show the source image, blended image, and both images with cell transfer in the slides. We choose to blend one or two objects such that we are able to learn more complicated displacement field. Instead of using segments annotated in Coco, we also explore advanced unsupervised segments. For unsupervised segments, more details can be found in the paper. To learn code segmentation, we extract the CNN features from the input images and conduct experiments using two different architectures, cross-image transformer and sparse and CNET. For both architectures, the input is a pair of images and the output contains mask predictions and a correspondence is mapped for each image. For cross image transformer, we have two modules, self attention and cross attention. Self attention is a standard attention mechanism and computer attention only in one image with considering position encoding. Where cross attention computes attention in a pair of images without using position encoding. Sparse and CNET computes correlations between two feature maps. These correlations are resized to 40 tensors that can be processed with 40 convolutions. For both architectures, we supervise the training with the mask and correspondences annotations. The objective functions shown in the slides and contains three terms. Here, M and C correspond to the mask and correspondences respectively. The first term is the cross entropy loss between the predicted and the grand truth mask. The last term corresponds to the L1 loss of the correspondences on the repeated regions. In the middle, we add a loss to connect the mask prediction and the correspondences prediction, which is the cross entropy loss on the transported mask wrapped using the predicted correspondences. The output of the network can be used to perform retrieval tasks. We evaluate the performance on Bruegel for one short detection. The goal is to identify the same visual details in a database as in a query. We define a score between a pair of images. The score contains joint mask term and a feature similarity term. The joint mask term is the product between the transported mask and the predicted mask on the source image. 
the feature similarity term corresponds to the cosine similarity between a pair of features defined by the predicted correspondences. Here are some visual results. We show the predicted masks as a transparency. We can see in the first row, even there are multiple objects repeated, our approach managed to spot repeated segments. In the second row, the repeated cards are in different contexts and in small scales. Our approach can still give a reasonable prediction. Quantitatively, we report performance for both retrieval and detection. For detection, we obtain bounding box by first cropping a big patch around the predicted correspondences, then computing cosine similarity on sliding window proposals. We employ features trained with MoCo, a CNN feature extractor. For retriever, both the cross image transformer and the sparse and CNET outperform previous approaches by an important margin. For detection, we find that the predictive correspondences of transformer are more precise and leads to superior performance compared to previous approaches. Note that previous approach leverages multi scale feature matching and a ransack, which is more complicated. Our approach is simpler and better. We also conduct experiments using unsupervised segments, which achieves comparable performance. These results suggest that our approach is not relied on the cocoa annotations. Our approach can also be used for place recognition. We conduct experiments on PISPER and DOQ datasets. The PISPER datasets is a large scale dataset with more than 10,000 database images and 8,000 queries. The POC dataset is particularly challenging as the queries are taken in nighttime while the database images are in daytime. Here are some real results using our models trained on synthetic pairs, which demonstrate a good generalization on both datasets. Quantitatively, we also achieve comparable performance compared to state of art approaches. This result is especially impressive since these benchmarks are very competitive and many dedicated methods leverage geo referenced images or real correspondences for supervision. On the contrary, our approach is generic and relies solely on our synthetic segments writing training. Note that we also conduct a detailed analysis on the architectures and the losses, which can be found in our project page. Instead of focusing on identifying repeated segments from pairs, in this work, we also explore how to perform discovery on a collection of images. Our solution relies on the predicted masks and the correspondences to build a graph and formulate the discovery as a clustering problem on the correspondences. Precisely, we build a graph where the nodes are correspondences. Here V is a set containing correspondences. We show the ice nodes in the slides. The nodes can be properly defined with the indexes of the source and target image SI and TI. Predicted correspondences XSI and XTI. Finally, the mask of prediction MI. The edges are consistency between the nodes. Precisely, we consider three cycle consistency. We only connect the correspondences which have exactly one image in common. Here are two nodes, which are two correspondences. Let's assume the correspondences I and J are both connected to image S. The formula is showing on the top, which seems to be complicated, but the concept is simple. We take into account both mask predictions and only connect the edges that the distance in the shared images are closed. We then consider the three cycles with XSJ, XTI, and XTJ. We transform XTJ to image TI using the predicted correspondences from TJ to TI. And we measure the distance between the transformed position and the XTI. The same operation is for XTI. We transform XTI to image TJ using the predicted correspondences from TI to TJ. And we measure the distance between the transformed position and the XTJ. Given the correspondences graph, we use the spectral decomposition of this adjacent matrix to obtain clusters of correspondences for discovery. Precisely, 
we first compute m principal eigenvectors, then perform k-means with k clusters. To reduce number of nodes in the graph, use mask predictions to remove the nodes and correspondences that are with low confidence. Some discovered clusters on Bruegel are visualized here. As we can see, the discovered patterns are not necessarily silent objects. They're also with diverse styles and different contexts. More results can be found in the project page. Apart from application artworks, our approach also achieves competitive performance on object discovery benchmark, which again demonstrates the robustness of our approach. To summarize, in this work, we show that it's possible to learn code segmentation with only synthetic pairs. We show the model trained on synthetic pairs work well on retrieval tasks. We also introduce correspondences graph for discovery and achieve competitive performance on object discovery benchmarks. Note that our code, data, and more experimental results are available in our project page. Thanks for your attention. Find the speaker in spirit. Thank you. No questions since uh, it's not around. Uh, the next talk is also going to be uh, a pre recorded video. Uh, it's the AAE, disparity alleviation autoencoder towards categorization of heritage images for aggrandized 3D reconstruction by Dixit Hegde and other people. Also. Hello, everyone. Myself, Dixit Hagade. I'm glad to present our DAAE, that is Disparity Elevation Auto Encoder towards categorization of heritage images for aggrandized 3D reconstruction. This work is carried out with Teja Sanvekar, Ramesh Shuktavi, and Kumar Mudingodi at Center of Excellence in Visual Intelligence, Kelly Technological University, Hubli, India. Due to natural calamities, there is degradation of heritage sites. There is need for the digitization of heritage sites. Through digitization, we can preserve the heritage sites for future generation. We can also further create a walkthrough of AR and VR. We can generate 3D models of heritage sites using single view or multi view images, LIDAR, scanners. But Scanners and leaders use pre processing steps. Collection of images of heritage sites across the globe is time consuming. Towards this, we perform the collection of images through crowd and name that the data has crowd source data. The data is unstructured and unlabeled, resulting in poor and merged 3D models, as shown here. A minimal Similarity between structures will create a merged 3D models. There is need for the categorization of these images as there is no associative labels for the crowdsource data on supervised categorization. That is clustering is one of the technique. Categorization of high dimensional data is computationally expensive and time consuming. Clustering needs lower dimensional features, which is disentangled and have complete information from the image space. Dimensionality reduction methods like PCA, kernel-based PCA, et cetera, extract features from images which might not be suitable for categorization. Extracting relevant features with deep learning-based methods is current trend. For deep clustering, recent work uses autoencoder, which computes loss in image manifold space. Ali et al, that's DAC, in et al, that is IDC, computes loss in latent and image manifold space individually. But there is lack of information validation from image space to latent space. Towards this, we propose disparity elevation autoencoder, that is DAE. In DA autoencoder, we have a DA encoder where we tap intermediate representation of the data. 
and the latencies. Towards optimization of the DA and code, we model reconstruction loss consisting of MSC loss function and structural dissimilarity loss, where structural dissimilarity loss consists of one minus structural similarity of the input image and reconstructed image. We perform three point approximation for inducing a contractive and discriminative optimization through theory of indiscriminables. Towards this, let us consider a pair of images i, j projected in image space xi and xj. When propagated to DA encoder, we get intermediate space or neural representation space of the images ai and ag respectively and latent representation z and zj. Three-point approximation results in copying the constraints from image space to latent space. Towards this, we introduce Jacobian of neural representation and latent representation for inducing nonlinear independent component analysis. We estimate the distance between the pair of images in their respective space, and we minimize the distance using the model loss function as shown here. Here, the distance metric can be a MSC or MA function. We demonstrate the effect of proposed model on latent space representation. We can see that there is overlapping clusters in AE, but similar classes are disentangled in DA latent space in both MNIST dataset and IDS10 dataset. We also compare clustering accuracy of our result of a proposed model with state-of-the-art method in the MNIST dataset. There is an increase of 10% accuracy. For fashion image data set, there is approximately 4% increase. In USPSC data set, there is approximately 5% increase. And for IDH, there is 18% increase than the state of the art models. By applying IDC as a plugin to DA encoder, we compare the results with the model using clustering loss as an order. In fashion image data set, there is an increase in 9% accuracy from the SOTA method. We present the effect of DA encoder on heritage sites before and after categorization through 3D reconstruction. We presented DAE, that is disparity elevation auto encoder, towards categorization of images for better 3D reconstruction. A modified version of autoencoder, which is robust and interpretable, it captures disentangled the features of images using disparity elevation loss function. Thank you. For more information, contact us at sevi at kdtech.ac.in. Yeah, let's send speaker again. The last two talks are in person. Uh, can the speaker come? Thank you. So, the first one of the last two talks is detecting and suppressing my cell for underwater visual slam, and the talk will be given by both Lars Martin Hodna and Ida Taibol. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Lars Martin Hodner. I'm joined by Arif Eichwald, and we're pleased to present a paper we made during our master's project on detecting and suppressing marine snow for underwater visual set. So first of all, uh, here's a video which shows you what marine snow is. Uh, Oh, I think um, I'll just switch to this version. Just a moment. Yeah, you can tell the white floating particles here is what we call marine snow. It's present throughout the open ocean at all depths. Uh, and it can be a bit of a headache for a feature based visual slam. Uh, and here you can see why. Uh, we've run the orb key point detector on this video sequence, and you can see it picks up on a lot of the marine snow in this scene. 
uh, and we made a synthetic uh, example and performed a post estimation on this, which highlights the effect of marine snow. Uh, you can see in the top uh, uh, point cloud, which is the sequence without the uh, snow, the white or uh, the yellow pipe here uh, is tracked straight as it should. But on the bottom, when we introduce marine snow in the sequence, the tracking fails quite quickly, despite the use of uh, staple uh, SLAM methods such as RANSTAC, ratio testing, and more. So this leads to our goal, which is to develop SLAM frontends, which are immune to marine snow motion noise. And the approach presented in our paper was to use deep learning for a key point classification after key point detection. Uh, we developed two schemes. First, a fully connected neural network, which classifies key point descriptors. And secondly, a convolutional neural network, which classifies key point image patches. Before we go into those, I will tell you about the custom data sets we made to train these and train and evaluate these uh, networks. Yeah, so there is uh, not uh, any grant group available to so create our own data set. So we created a data set of key points containing uh, key point image patches or regions around each key point and the various uh, key point descriptors. And then each key point is given a label of either clean or marine snow. The method we use to do this is to label trivial images, that is images, images that are either exclusively with or without the snow. So on the top, we can see an image that is completely without snow. And on the bottom, we can see an image that is exclusively snow on a flat blue background. So this uh, allows us to label on a per image basis instead of labeling each uh, key point individually. However, this comes at the cost of quite low data diversity, as each snowy key point is now located on a flat blue background. So to increase our diversity in the data, we use uh, superimposing. So here's an example of the superimposing we do. We start with the exclusively snowy image and extract the snow to create the snow mask, which we can then use to superimpose the first image on any random background of our own choosing. So I have to type in a little bit more detail. On the left, we can see the input, which is the snowless background and the snowy image, both of which can be sequences. And on the top of the right, we can see the output. So to do this, we use a weighted sum between the two images with the snow mask as the weight. And to generate the snow mask, we start by calculating the median color of the snowy image. And I'm calculating a pixel to median color distances for all the pixels in the image before we scale the distances by one or of maximum distance. And then, because we only want the snowflakes and not the background to be included in our snow mask, we set a threshold where any distance below the threshold is set to zero. And to remove any shadows or dark areas in the image, we use a shadow threshold from bit to pixel values and set those to zero as well. And then to reduce image artifacting, we do this last page in a squared window with a 60 by 60 divided of 10 and average out over the windows. And then to extract the key point, we do key point extraction on the snowless sequence and extract the snow separately to maintain uh, data balance. And then to make sure all the key points are still valid in the final sequence, we use uh, filtering on the key points. The snowless key points are filtered based on their proximity to the snow and the extracted snow. And the uh, snow key points are filtered based on the visibility in the final sequence by comparing the variance in a patch around the key point in the Snow sequence and in the superimposed snow sequence. And then to reduce the beta, as we are quite a few of the key points, we use random grid selection to reduce it for setting up the key points and importantly, computing the descriptors on the final superimposed sequence. So to briefly cover the classifiers, the patch classifier, uh, as I said, is a convolutional neural network. It's based on a multi-scale input where we extract patches at three scales and we size them to have the same height and width. The architecture itself is a rather standard uh, CNN style architecture. So we end with a sigmoid output layer to give us pseudo probability of the inputs class. Uh, the descriptor classifier is a fully connected neural network. We found through testing that the ORB descriptor was uh, the best overall compared to Freak, SIFT and VGG. And again, we have the sigmoid output layer uh, to give the pseudo probability. And both of these uh, networks are rather compact to keep the inference speeds low. 
So summarizing the quantitative results uh, on the test data sets, we found that models trained on unmodified data were, as predicted, unable to cope with the textured backgrounds uh, from the superimposed data sets. When training on superimposed images, this did uh, improve the um, performance on the texture backgrounds, back almost to the levels of the unmodified data. Uh, and also it did not worsen, worsen the performance on that uh, original unmodified uh, test data set. We see that patch classification consistently performs better than descriptive classification, uh, although this uh, tendency was not as clear in the qualitative tests. And finally, given the, the how good the performance is in these metrics, we think that improving the models further uh, should not be a priority. Instead, uh, focusing on the realism of the data set is what's needed to uh, create the results which generalize well onto real world sequences. Uh, because, as we can tell from the qualitative results here, first from the patch classifier, in this case, uh, blue indicates a clean classification, red indicates a marine snow. Uh, we can see that uh, while most uh, uh, key points are classified correctly, there is uh, some tendency to have uh, false negatives where snow is classified as clean. Moving on to the descriptor classifier, this was uh, one of the sequences where it outperformed the patch classifier. Uh, we can see particularly in the region in the upper left, the patch classifier struggled tremendously and the descriptor classifier does a bit better but still has uh, some amount of false negatives. Going back to the point clouds from the introduction, uh, we can see once we introduce no classification, the bottom point cloud now matches the case without synthetic snow. This was the case for both uh, key point classification schemes and seems to indicate that as long as uh, or considering the differences in earlier uh, testing, it seems that as long as we can reduce the number of unreliable key points below a certain threshold that the traditional key point prediction methods can do the rest. So to summarize, we presented two key point classification schemes to combat marine snow and slam. Slam performance was similar between the two schemes and we also on the snow can be extracted from textualist images and superimposed to improve data variety for uh, our data sets. Uh, however, some work still remains to reliably classify snow on texture backgrounds to eliminate those uh, final false negatives. Thank you. As for the talk, do we have any questions at the moment? I have a question actually. So, so my question would be like for like very core of approach. Why do you like you decided to remove key points and not denoise image first, like train some kind of model for denoising and then detect them clean? Yeah, this was uh, a common method uh, perhaps a few years back in, in uh, image restoration works. Uh, but the issue is uh, that these marine snow particles can be so large that uh, denoising simply does not uh, uh, get rid of them all. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Thank you. So we have one last paper talk. Speaker in the room. Uh, it seems so. So the last uh, talk for this block is SE Laughter, which is a case for using rotation invariant features in state of the art feature matchers. The talk will be given by uh, George. George? It depends on language, George. <laughs> <laughs> How to say George Butler. Hi, my name is George. I present this work, which is joint work with my supervisor, Friedrich. And uh, here's the main takeaway straight away. So if you have a state-of-the-art uh, image matcher like Lofter, you can modify the backbone by exchanging it from a CNN to a rotation equivariant CNN. And if you do that, you can obtain good performance on ordinary image pairs 
as Lofter has, while improving performance a lot on rotated image pairs. All right, so what is Lofter? Um, many of you probably know, I'll do a quick overview. So there's a feature pyramid CNN that extracts some features at two levels. And the course features are concatenated with positional encodings and fed into a type of transformer. Then there's a matching of these features and uh, some refinement of the features using the fine level feature maps. Finally, we get uh, matches from course locations in the first image to subpixel locations in the second image. So here's a failure case of Lofter on rotated images. You can see that it only finds matches on this uh, very repetitive structure and all of them are incorrect. And here's another failure on rotated images. Again, all matches found by Lofter are incorrect. Um, and here are four more matches found by Lofter and two of these are correct and two are incorrect. So can you tell which are correct? Um, here are the images. So actually the, the two left correspondences are correct. As you can see, they are just rotations of each other and some illumination changes. And the two rightmost correspondences are incorrect. So we would like the method to have more matches of the type to the left and fewer of the type to the right. So why doesn't Lofter give us more of the type to the left? Well, because the CNN backbone doesn't guarantee that rotated versions of patches actually have similar features. Um, now let's see if this GIF works on this computer. Seems like it doesn't. All right, uh, skip this. And um, the way to get a rotation equivariant CNN that I used was to go by this framework by Weiler and CESA from NURPS 2019 called E2 Equivariant Steerable CNNs. And they have a very principled approach to constructing these rotation equivariant CNNs that builds on what's called representation theory in abstract algebra. And I won't have time to explain what that is, but they provide a very nice PyTorch package called E2 CNN, which makes it easy to construct these rotation equivariant CNNs. And I use that in my experiments. So let's have an example of a rotation invariant feature map or a feature field. So we say that a feature field given an input image I, a feature field F has rotation invariant features or a more complex um, accurate name. If when we rotate the input image, the positions of the features also rotate, but the features themselves don't change. So for instance, a blurred version of the input image. If we have the input image on the left and then blur it and then rotate, we get the rightmost picture. And also if we first rotate and then blur, we get the rightmost picture. So that means that the blurred version of the input is a rotation invariant feature map. Uh, and more generally, we can have rotation equivariant feature maps. So for instance, the gradient field is such a thing. So that means that when rotating the input image, uh, the features change position and they also rotate. I think this is commonly known as covariant features in the image matching community. Uh, I've used the word equivariant and that means the same thing. And equivariant is the name that's used in these um, papers on uh, rotation equivariant CNNs. That's why I use it. So here, here's the gradient field of this piano image. Again, if we rotate uh, the input image, uh, the gradient field will also rotate. Unfortunately, we can't quite see what happens here, but the um, arrows don't just move, the arrows also rotate. And that means that they are equivariant. Um, and the Weiler and CSI in their paper give a very nice uh, overview how to construct these equivariant layers that preserve this equivariance um, between very general kinds of feature fields acted on by the rotation group. So um, the idea in this paper is simply to take Lofter, replace the CNN backbone by a SC2 equivariant CNN. That means both rotations and translation equivariant. And uh, for the feature maps in this uh, backbone, we choose the regular representation of finite rotation groups. 
and I won't have time to explain what that means either, unfortunately. But um, we use rotation equivariant features in the intermediate layers of the CNN and rotation invariant features in the output layers. So what's actually ma uh, matched between the two images are rotation invariant features in this work. Um, and here we see the image from before. We can see that SC2 Lofter managed to find matches that were unavailable to Lofter. And that's because the regions that SE2 Lofter finds these, uh, these matches in look too dissimilar to Lofter because they are rotated versions of each other. Um, again, here's another image we saw before, and SE2 Lofter finds many correct matches. And here's the final example we saw where SE2 Lofter again outperforms Lofter. So in this work, we consider three versions of this SE2 Lofter. And they differ in what discretization of the rotation group uh, is used. So either we use fourth rotations or eighth rotations. So these are quite coarse discretizations. And they also differ in the relative number of intermediate backbone features. So when we use these rotation equivariant CNNs, we get a lot more weight sharing than by just using ordinary CNNs. And that's why the number of learnable parameters drop when we introduce these rotation equivariant CNNs. And if we compensate for this by increasing the number of backbone features, we get more learnable parameters, but we also get a larger CNN and hence more compute time and memory consumption. So there's some trade off there. And here's some quantitative results on homography estimation on H patches um, and also on H patches R45, which is a version of H patches where I've just rotated the images 45 degrees arbitrarily. Um, and the main takeaways from this is, I think, that uh, SE2 Lofter, the big version without the star here, it can outperform Lofter on uh, H-patches in general. And also on H-patches R45, SE2 Lofter uh, simply outperforms Lofter a lot, all versions. And also that the performance of, of SE2 Lofter in general improves more on the viewpoint sequences than on the illumination sequences in H patches. Okay, um, here's some future ideas. Uh, there is uh, actually an issue in the positional encodings that they are not rotation invariant. So if you want the complete rotation invariant method, you should fix this. You can do this by using relative positional encodings or something like that in the transformer layers. Um, we could try to incorporate equivariant or covariant features. Uh, this was also, I learned a lot about this yesterday in the affine correspondences uh, workshop, which was nice. Um, and also we could try incorporating scale equivariance somehow. And we could try to find an actual application where this is <laughs> useful. So uh, I only showed artificial examples of um, artificially rotated images, but uh, in microscopy or aerial images, um, rotation invariance is more important. Uh, so here's the main takeaway again. You can replace the backbone of a uh, feature matcher to be rotation equivariant, and then your, me um, your method will work better on rotated images. Right. Thanks. That's not at all. Do we have any questions? We do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically it's a type of uh, pooling operation. You average over the rotation equivariant features in a way to get invariant features. Yeah. Try Uh, I didn't. I didn't try anything. I so basically what I did was using the implementation of this package, and I just specified these layers should have these properties, and these layers should have these properties, and then it automatically does linear layers that satisfy this. So that will give me an, an average pool. And but yeah, you're right that many other pooling methods could be used to go from equivariant to invariant features. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so SC3 equivalent background um, would make sense if you have an input that's not an image, but a volume in some sense, I think. Uh, or if you were to make some very advanced algorithm where you sort of try to find the actual 3D positions of these points in the method itself uh, in the early layers somehow. But I don't, uh, I don't think it's directly applicable. No. Uh, sorry. Uh, you mean a SC3 equivalent? Yeah. Um, no, I haven't tried. I don't think it, it makes sense on images because they are not three dimensional. So, but unless I miss, I miss, I might have misunderstood your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the, this is the last talk for this block. We have one last block, but it's mostly about the challenge that should be in about uh, right? So it should start in five minutes, I think, uh, which we'll is uh, take uh, 10 extra minutes and uh, let's meet up again in like 15 minutes here. So we can uh, do the last block of the workshop. Thank you. Now we have a coffee talk, so I'll coffee break. So please take some time. We should be back at 4.35 approximately. Thank you. We are muted, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. uh, we have you. Thank you. Uh, so it's time to so start. Uh, um, okay. okay. Wait, wait. Like, we need to. Yeah, yeah sure. But I want to see the, yeah. the slides. You can share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Can you please answer my? Okay, so now I will start my presentation. Give, give us a second. Can you maximize the, the, the slides? If possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we will present the first place solution of the IMT challenge. What? Sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, okay sorry, we're going to uh, we'll do it and we start. Uh, so, this is the uh, last uh, uh, block of the workshop. Now, we're going to talk about the, uh, the challenge presentation.
So I, I forgot we had some slides that we wanted to go over. Uh, can you start presenting and we'll do that first? It's going to take about 10 minutes. Uh, can I start now? No, no, sorry. Uh, we have to go over some slides uh, from the organizers first. So it's a mix up. Okay. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's not fine yet. It's a bit chaotic. Do you want to do this or do it? Just wait for your picture. Okay. 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 Uh, apologies about this. So uh, let me just do this part. Uh, so we are re re reintroducing the image matching challenge, uh, which is very different from what we had the past few years. Uh, so as I said before, uh, we moved to Kaggle, uh, uh, and uh, the challenge is sponsored by Google this year, same as the, the last three years, but now with a substantial price pool of two thousand uh, ten thousand uh, dollars. Uh, if you want to know more about the challenge for the previous years, uh, you can check the live streams, which are still for the last two years, which were the you know, pandemic editions of fully virtual ones available uh, online on YouTube. Uh, I want to just plug quickly the paper that we wrote uh, a while ago, uh, which was published at IJCV, which has many, many lessons that we learned uh, about how to uh, basically evaluate this entire system in a way that you can look at uh, you know one number that is truly downstream and gives you an idea of how good a method whether it's local feature or matching uh, is uh, how good the method is uh, in terms of like pose estimation which is uh, a bit difficult to do uh, we also uh, published the open source the uh, benchmark uh, which has been available for a while, and we'll soon publish the ground truth. So uh, we originally kept this uh, private so that people had to submit uh, local features or matches to us, and we will find the rest of the, the, the pipeline. And uh, now we'll be able to do that yourself if, if you wish so. So why did we move things to Kagon? Uh, the thing is that with self-hosting a contest, which is what we did before, we had a number of issues, right? Uh, one big one was the adoption. So the previous format had very limited adoption and specifically very few scientific papers wanted to use it. Uh, it was quite nice in the second edition because as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the workshop, we had a number of like really noble research works that used it. But on the third one, we saw a drift towards just uh, taking whatever was available and uh, putting things together, engineering them, and trying to get good numbers, which is fine, but it's uh, a bit of a competing objective, right? So if you uh, are going to compete against over-engineer solutions uh, with a simple method that has like one single contribution, uh, you are likely not going to be like number one on the leaderboards, and you know, it's the issue of, uh, is this method truly state-of-the-art or the line? That makes it a bit difficult. And also ease of use, uh, which was the opposite, right? Lack of ease of use. Uh, it was a very local feature, local matching centric. So if you wanted to do things like apply a dense method that gives you a pixel to pixel prediction for two images for every pixel, that was not really possible. It was kind of possible, but difficult to do. And you could not do things like direct post estimation, right? We had some artificial categories. So for instance, we had submissions up to 2000 key points pretty much, up to 8000 key points pretty much. And it didn't work very well on methods like uh, laughter, for instance, which uh, uh, don't have a fixed uh, budget, right? Uh, the uh, benchmark required uh, a lot of manual processing because people typically sent us uh, large match files, which are pairwise, right? So we have uh, 100 images, uh, which have uh, a lot more uh, possible combinations between them, and that quickly becomes a bit intractable. Uh, tuning was computationally expensive because uh, it had to be done by uh, the, uh, the participants to the challenge on their own machines and then they submitted one final solution over the test set. Uh, and uh, the whole thing required a lot of manual processing, scoring was slow, so it's a bit annoying and it was made significantly worse last year because we tripled the amount of data, right? So then uh, it was a lot more tuning. Uh, so 
data files that we had to submit were larger, uh, the uh, compute was also more costly, et cetera. So what does Kaggle do for you that helps you solve these problems? Uh, so there's no constraints other than uh, compute and the dependencies. You need to uh, submit uh, a notebook uh, that runs in about nine hours, whether it's CPU or GPU, and you have to use uh, libraries that are available, but that's about it. And we set this up as a code competition. So what you do is you just wrap your code on a Jupyter notebook. Uh, it runs over uh, just a few images. So we publish, for instance, three uh, pairs of images, and then you uh, run it offline uh, on data that you don't see, and then you get a score. Uh, this allows for very fast iteration, so that you can really make multiple submissions. You can uh, work on this every day, uh, and on on our site, it gives us a lot of exposure uh, and access to a new community. So we have actually uh, some high scoring submissions from freelancers, people who had not no uh, no previous experience working on this problem, uh, which is I think pretty cool. So one thing that changed was that we simplified the challenge a lot. So we have uh, a single data set and a single task, which is hysteria. We used to have a mapping task, which was basically doing very small scale uh, SFM, a structure for motion, so 3D reconstructions, but many of them. Uh, this time, uh, due to the difficulty to set the second task up at Kaggle, at, uh, uh, because it requires installing call map, it requires a lot of compute, we decided to just try to keep it simple and we'll just image to image matching, which is one of the, the main topic for the workshop. So that's quite fine. We use the proprietary data set. Slides are not shared via Zoom. They are not shared via Zoom. I don't know why. We don't know why. Okay, it's we are stupid. That's why. Okay. Good. Apologies. It's a complicated format. So uh, we use the proprietary dataset, uh, which is phone based. It's similar to one of the datasets that we had last year. Uh, it has about ten thousand pairs of images uh, over over a. Uh, over 100 uh, different cities, so all over the world. Uh, and the goal is to estimate the pose, uh, the relative pose change between these two images in terms of the fundamental matrix. So you estimate the fundamental matrix. Uh, and the back end uh, at Kaggle evaluates the quality of the pose in terms of the mean average accuracy at different rotation and translation thresholds for these two uh, images. Uh, you participate by, as I said, writing a simple uh, Jupyter notebook. The competition is still open, so you can look at, uh, it's closed, but you can still make submissions if you want. So you can look at all of the examples, you can uh, test it out for yourself. Uh, it's quite good. There's also a lot of resources in the uh, discussion boards, which is quite uh, useful if you are not very familiar with this problem, and even if you are. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, it worked quite well. So we uh, increase the number of participation in terms of teams by a factor of 25 and 150 times uh, as many submissions. Um, what didn't work so well, I think this is uh, the more interesting slide in this block uh, because it's the, the lessons that we learned is that there is a big gap in terms of a domain gap uh, between the, what we call the training data and the test data because it's just quite different. For training data, what we did was rehash the uh, one of the data sets, the largest one that we had uh, in the previous uh, versions of the workshop as a challenge. So this is the data set that uh, we used since 2019. And uh, it's quite different. So results on this training set do not necessarily translate uh, to the test set. And we call it training, but it's not really uh, used for training, right? Uh, we, uh, it is suitable, so you have a relatively large number of images and scenes, you have depth maps, but the problem is that fine tuning these kind of methods is really expensive. So for instance, Lofter, one of the methods that were often used in this version of the challenge, uh, trains on 64 uh, 10, 18 DPTIs, right? So that's just something that you don't have at Kaggle. You can have uh, like one single GPU and with limited compute. So it's a bit uh, difficult to try to set something there. You have to do it on your own by downloading the data set. It's quite large, so it's a bit complicated. The evaluation thresholds are a bit loose. So you see that the results are quite high on the 0 0.8 over one uh, uh, kind of uh, level. 
it was a bit short. Uh, it was a lot of work on our end. Uh, we had to make many changes to what we had last year. And that meant that we could only run it for two months, which I think is still pretty good, but uh, a bit uh, shorter than Kaggle competitions ideally run for, which would be about three months. And one really interesting and really annoying um, problem is that uh, we still haven't decided who actually gets the monetary prizes. The way that we set this up is you can win, uh, keep your place in the leaderboards, uh, but due to legal reasons, uh, you have to open source your code. And uh, many methods, specifically the, the much click ones that uh, Tom presented at the beginning of the workshop, since they are industry work, they are not open sourced. And uh, uh, some, some of them are like Superpoint has a, an open implementation, but Superglue doesn't. And people who have tried to reproduce Superglue uh, have not been successful in reproducing the exact numbers. So it, it's a bit difficult, and we have to probably think of a better solution in the future to, to address this problem, right? Because you want people to be able to, to really compete and at the same time to earn the prize, which is a strong motivation to participate in, in this kind of contest. So the results this time is going to be very boring because they have been available since the beginning of the since the end of the contest, right? Everything is public, so you can just uh, look at the leaderboards of Kaggle if you want more details. Uh, many solutions are you know published on the forums with a lot of detail what people tried, what they didn't uh, try, what worked, what did not work. So it's actually a lot of interesting conclusions if you want to learn more about this problem. And that's the end of this uh, block. So uh, now we'll have, uh, we were going to have five talks. I think we'll have to drop one of them, the last one, because the speaker has some uh, legal issues uh, and is not able to discuss his solution with us today. Uh, so we'll have talks from the uh, first, third, fifth, and seventh uh, place in the challenge, which I think is a nice combination of um, more engineering solutions and also some very novel uh, works. So, oh, sorry. Oh, this is uh, so now we can finally. Dimitro? Sorry, I don't know how to use this. So now we can move on to the, the winners of the challenge. Sorry, Hong uh, for the uh, mix up before. Now we are actually ready for you. Uh, okay. So, yeah. uh, yes. You can share screen. You can share your screen. Okay. okay. Uh, I can't share the screen. Uh, uh, you, yes, yes. Okay. I'm sharing, yes, no, right? Okay, okay. okay. Um, can, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will present the first place solution of the IMC challenge. Uh, we are Wu Shui, uh, Wang Chanming, Song Hongjian, and Yuki Kashiwaba. <clears throat> we will first introduce our two stage solution, then show some ablation study results. In short, we utilize DeepScan to find the co visible area and refine the matching in these areas. And we call this method matching key point prop. Our solution is totally based on this matching key points crop algorithm. Uh, this is our pipeline. The two blocks represent the two, the two stages matching respectively. In the first stage, we use Lofter and SPSG to match two images. Uh, in to simplify, I will call the super point and super glue as SPSG in this presentation. Concatenating the key points of two models, we obtain the key points of stage one. Then we use deep scan to fit these points to propose the co visible area. We'll then generate a bounding box for each image, which represents the co visible area and crop along these bounding boxes to get the input images of the second stage. In stage two, we do secondary matching with Lofter, SPSG, and DKM on the cropped area. In the end, we, fight, we concatenate the key points produced by stage one and stage two 
to get the final key points and apply a modified ransack method in OpenCV to get the fundamental matrix. This is the output of the matching key points crop. These key points are produced by the model in stage one. Then we apply a disk scan to cluster on those key points. The two boxes in each pair represent, represents the co-visible area found by our math method. In these two images, we can see that it does a good job of finding the co-visible region where obtains the most significant features in both images. At the same time, because we we will then crop along the bounding box and only infer on the area covered by the bounding boxes. We can filter out sky, street, and moving objects, which are useless. Um, the matching key points crop consists of three steps. First, we use this scan to cluster on the matching key points of two images. Then with those clusters, we can get one bounding box for each image. Finally, we will crop the area covered by the bounding boxes. We have two motivations for proposing this approach. First, we want to refine the matching of the key regions. And second, we want to filter out liars appropriately. Um, by the way, there are many clustering with algorithm. Why do we choose deep scan? The first reason is that deep scan is a density based method which fits this, this task well. Second, deep scan is robust to outliers. Third, we never need to specify the number of clusters before we apply a deep scan. So that's why we use it. This is the flow of this method. We will first match on both images in stage one and cluster on those key points. After clustering, we will have many clusters. Then we will face a problem of how to choose the cluster to generate bounding boxes. To solve it, we propose a dynamic strategy to select cluster. This dynamic select Selection method is based on the relative ratio of the number of matching points. In this method, the clusters are selected in the descending order of number. The selection is repeated until the ratio of the current select, selected cluster and the previous one is less than a threshold. For example, in the left image, the green cluster has most key points. So we first select the green one. Next, the yellow one is the second largest. So we calculate the ratio of the yellow one and the green one. The result is larger than the threshold. So we also select the yellow one. By repeating this, we select the red one and reject the pink one and the outliers. Finally, we can get a bounding box for the left image through the green, yellow, and red clusters. We find that sometimes the key points may not occur on the edges of the bounding box. In this case, if we just crop along the bounding box, you may miss some useful area. Therefore, we expand the bounding box by padding. As the right pair shows, padding the bounding box reduces the amount of wasted area and increases the public score. In our challenge solution, we multiplied a factor of 1.05 in only in the horizontal direction because our experiment have shown that vertical extensions tend to include some useless areas such as skies and roads. Here are all the models we use in both stages. The first four models are for stage one and the rest are for stage two. The first four models are used for both disk scan and getting the fundamental matrix. 
Matching on the co-visible area is apparently faster than matching on the whole image. So we applied a slightly larger resolution for the models in, sec in the second stage. Let's list the key of winning this challenge. The most important thing is the proposed matching key point algorithm. And second is ensemble Lofter and SPSG to get a better bounding box in the first stage. Uh, for example, the left figure is only using Lofter in stage one, and the right one applies both Lofter and SPSG in stage one. Uh, both image, images apply the same model in stage two. You can find that the bounding box in the right figure is obviously better than the left one, so it can get uh, a better matching result. And ensemble both stage is also in important. In fact, even only using the key points in stage two can get a great result. But adding the key points in stage one can save some wasted area by the matching key point crop method and give a better result. Uh, for example, in this pair, uh, in this pair, we can see that there are many correct matches in the right part of the right image, but they are not included by the bounding box. So if we only use the matching point of the stage two to calculate the fundamental matrix, we will waste all this useful information. And the multiple resolution ensemble is also useful. Uh, for example, in this image, uh, the left one is uh, left one is add, adding the uh, SPSG of 840 resolution to the first stage. Uh, we can capture some patterns that we missed before in the circle. And here is some ablation study result. Uh, here is for the model. Uh, we can see that uh, we did not apply the matching key points crop and fix the parameters of Ransack. Uh, the lot of praise best in the past data and SPSG can give a big improve to ensemble with Lofter. And BCAM can also uh, bring some improves. Uh, here we can see the power of matching key points crop. Using only the key points of stage two could have made us ranking top three. Uh, using key points of both stage made us, made us the first place. After competition, we tested different testing uh, padding strategies. Surprisingly, uh, as the last two rows list, adding a fixed number to pixels gets the best score. Um, when tested on the training data, our strategy was to, was to add padding on, only horizontally because we think adding the padding vertically tends to include some unnecessary, unnecessary areas. However, perhaps there is a difference between the test data set and the training set. Padding on both directions are more effective for the test data in the ablation study. Uh, thank you very much. This all, our, all, all of our presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I have actually like a question. So like I said that this uh, DB span is uh, uh, robust to outliers. And that's the uh, like question. How did you, did you actually evaluate this or just because it's always empirically improved for performance? Um, because, uh, for example, in DeepScan, can you see that slide? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, in many cluster algorithms, the outliers will be added into one cluster 
but in deep scan, it will still remain the outliers and it will not add it into any cluster. So that's why we think it, because we want to reject the outliers. And I think, so we think this, this is fit this task. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone from Zoom have a question or from audience? Uh, oh, okay, thank you. And I actually, I would really encourage you to try to publish this uh, like DBSCAN outlier filtering approach and like uh, compare it to like one it and so, so I think it's well engineering to like, uh, like fresh thing. Okay, we also have one more question in Zoom chat. Is uh, su super glue lighter than lofter? Uh, in Zoom chat, is it still lighter than? Yes, it's, it's much lighter than lofter. Much lighter and much faster in our experiment. Like any other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you again. Okay. And so I will stop we... my screen. Yes. And I'll go to the next, uh, which is super recorded video. And uh, but uh, I think the authors might be in in Zoom to answer questions. So let's let's do it. Hello everyone. This is Team Ariel. It is our pleasure to be here to show our method for the CVPI image matching challenge. This work is conducted by Jian Xu, Kai Huang, Wen Sun, Gao Tongyu. Wang and Ke Jian Wu. And all of us come from. Sorry, that same stupid mistake again. And thank you for letting us know early. Share screen because I forget to do this. Okay. This is Team Ariel. It is our pleasure to be here to show our method for the CVPI image matching challenge. This work is conducted by Jian Xu, Kai Huang, Wen Sun, Gao Tongyu, Zhi Cheng Wang, and Ke Jian Wu. And all of us come from the company in Rio. We will present our work in the following parts. We will start with our solution pipeline, followed by individual modules and their corresponding results. Firstly, we will introduce our entire pipeline with this flowchart. In general, our algorithm can be divided into four submodels Superpoint Superglue Refinement, Disk Superglue and Refinement, Lofter, and DKM. Each of the baseline can achieve good performance and we assemble them using AMS based on matching score. In adaptive augmentation, you compute transformation based on original matching results. Then you match the transformed image again and repeat adaptive augmentation after AMS called the iterative augmentation. Now, let me talk about each module. As for the title-based sub-methods, superpoint and disk use local feature refinement to improve features accuracy. This network predicts a flow from point in one image to its tentative match in the other, and corrects the position of the point according to flow. We obtain a more accurate sub pixel position. Specifically, as for training 
clue based on this. We use mega depth dataset with higher learning rates and uh, stricter constraints for ground truth based on reprojection error. We also modify the loss to balance the matched and non-matched points. Finally, we got the following proved results. Once we get match key points from our four methods, we fuse all of them together. The simplest ensemble strategy is direct concatenation. As shown in the table, ensemble significantly improve performance. However, direct concatenation produce a lot of one-to-many wrong matches. To solve this problem, we propose matching MS to filter proximity key points based on matching score. As a result, matching MS further improved performance. Furthermore, we propose an adaptive augmentation method. Firstly, we compute the transformation based on original matching results. Then we match again based on the transform image. Due to time constraints, we only deduct augmentation when the number of original matched key points is small. As shown in the table, our iterative augmentation strategy further improves performance. To summarize, in this work, we have found that fusion of different matching methods can boost the matching result. Moreover, matching in stability region and adaptive augmentation significantly improve performance. Last but not least, result operation and RASX strategy also contribute to better results. This is all I have for our technical work. And uh, let me finish this presentation with a brief introduction to our team. We are from Company Aerial, who is leading the world in the revolutionary AR transformation. Aerial has made the first consumer AR glasses that are super light and easy to use. With the integration with mobile internet content ecosystem and mass production capacity. You can learn more about us on the website. Thank you for listening and feel free to ask questions. Okay, thank you, our virtual presenters. And it seems they are not here for questions. So I'm going to the Sorry? yeah, long D. It's a five uh, place uh, solution. So are you showing correctly? Yeah, you, you can check it there. Okay. Hello everyone. This is a report of a fifth place solution of image matching computation 2022. First, I will begin by giving you an overview of our pipeline. Then we will introduce related models we use in this pipeline. Two of them are public available and another proposed by us. Next, we will show how each part of the pipeline works in details. Finally, we will analyze the results and show some possible solutions which may help improve the performance. Our pipeline is pretty simple. It consists of three parts, SPSG in red, Loft in yellow, and EcoTR in green. In the first part, we apply SPSG on regional image pairs and get matches at one. Then we crop the patches based on the first run SPSG and apply the second run SPSG on crop patches and get matches at two. In the second part, we use Lofter to get more accurate matches, 
taking crop patches as input. Next, we use EcoTR to find matches provided by SPSG in first and second round. Finally, assemble all the matches, including SPSG matches refined by EcoTR and locked matches, and find fundamental metrics by MaxSec++. About the related models, like most of previous solution, we use SPSG and Lopter as well. SPSG gives sparse matches and Lopter gives semi-dense matches. SPSG is more friendly to things with extreme wide baseline image pairs than Lopter due to the differences in attention type of transformer and third space. While semi-dense methods like Lopter provide more accurate matches, we resemble two of these models and achieve far better performance than either of them. Then I'd like to have a brief introduction to our new model, EcoTR. Similar with Cotter in last year's workshop, we propose a functional query method which takes arbitrary position Q in one image as input and the model will find its correspondence in the other image. Thanks to the end-to-end -end structure, our model runs dozens to hundred times faster than quarter. As shown in the right image, two methods are tested with same resolution input and similar GPU memory cost. So that we can apply functional method into this year's computation within limited running time. Moreover, this model can cooperate with other matching models. Taking predicted matches of other model as input, EcoTR could refine the matches by fine level transformer blocks, just like patch to pixel does in its visual localization experiment. Okay, then we show the details of our method. In part one, images are resized before fetching to SPSG, alongside are resized to 1,600 pixels. As for two-stage matching, first, we take original image pairs as input and obtain matches at one. Then, we simply crop the patches and keep all the patches in first round SPSG inside. Next, we run SPSG in the second type of crop patches and get matches at two. And as we can see in the top right corner, two stage SPSG got 0.773 in its test set, which scores much higher than public SPSG baseline. In step two, we resize alongside to 1200 pixels for each patch crop in previous step and keep the aspect ratio. As shown in the right image, the output a semi-dense match set three. Moreover, Lopter gives some noisy matches and we can see most of these matches are removed after max set plus plus. As for scores, the example of aforementioned two models, SPSG and Lopter, performed pretty well in test set, getting 0.836 higher than either of them. In step three, we are going to show how our model EcoTR works. As mentioned above, EcoTR only refines the matches provided by SPSG. This is an example of how refinement works. Points in red are one match pair formed by SPSG. EcoTR takes the position of Curie and the course match as input and outputs the position of the refined match in orange. Apply this refinement on our pipeline as step three yields increase of 1% on computation. Besides, we also evaluate the refined method on YFCC dataset in line with SPSG. Results on this dataset give similar trends. It's also worth pointing out that the score can be further improved by setting virtual matches during refinement step. For each match pair formed by SPSG, 
we set a pair of virtual matches around them. For example, refinement method without virtual matches provided 179 matches after MagSec++, Y method with virtual matches provides 351 matches. As for the score, this trick yields increase of 0.4%. We didn't apply Moody threading in this computation. More than half of running time are caused during finding fundamental metrics by MaxSec++. So the number of key points and models are limited. We believe using more key points and example of more models would achieve better performance. Besides, we simply use triple crop strategy and we can improve it by removing noisy matches using overlap estimation method and so on. That's all, thanks. And I think the last speakers should be in person if I am not mistaken. So, are you here? Yes. Great, so this is your slides. Yeah. yeah. This is the first. Um, hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I guess we're the only team presenting live here. It's great to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting us. We are Hyukjin Guan, Singo Baek, and Chung Xingmun. I'm going to be um, talking about our approach for Image Matching Challenge 22. So this is the overview of our pip pipeline. We firstly get the matching points um, using baseline model after here, and get the extra matching points using our methods, such as warping matching or copy matching. And then we concatenate all the matching points together and then apply radius NMS to filter out some matching points based on the score within the given radius. And then apply RENSEC, uh, in this case VSEC, to uh, filter out some outliers and estimate the fundamental matrix. First, for, for the baseline selection, there are four factors we, that we considered. is license, public leaderboard score, position dependency, and whether the model is detector-free or not. And there are uh, three best models for candidates. Uh, but for a super point super glue combination, because they're restricted for uh, commercial usage, so we decided not to use this model for the baseline. And uh, the Lofter and DKM, both of them are permitted for commercial usage, and also they are position dependent and detector free model. But the Lofter got a little bit higher public leadover score in our experiment, so we chose Lofter as our baseline model. And this is the short analysis of the baseline. We firstly get the matching points using baseline model. Um, and then we, uh, as you see here in the, in the bottom of the slide, there's th uh, three test sample pairs and the region of interest or dance region uh, were connected with the green lines correspondences here. But there's also not meaningful region um, such as cars, roads or bikes or people. There's some false positives on those regions. And also we could see that in hard cases like uh, the third image pair, the match points are spread out everywhere. And also the model just uh, found less um, true positive uh, match points and more false positives. So we just tried to come up with some ideas to solve these problems. The first idea was k-means and cropping. So firstly, we clustered the matching points, uh, matching points using k-means clustering algorithm and then uh, select the uh, cluster that contains the most matching points and crop the image around the cluster. And we can also do the same for the, uh, the other image of a pair like this. And then we resize the cropped image and then get the matching points with the other uh, cropped image. We found, uh, we found that this resizing strategy also works. And uh, this is the comparison between original matching and cropped matching. As you can see here, uh, we were able to uh, cut off some uninteresting regions like cars and roads. So the model could ignore it. The next idea was warping matching. 
uh, because there's, uh, we already saw some hard cases like the third image pair in the previous slide, um, the model was facing some problems with uh, finding some meaningful matching points because the images of a pair were taken from very largely different views. So firstly, we uh, get the matching points using baseline here as well and uh, calculate the homographic matrices. Uh, such as from uh, image one with respect to the image two and the other way around it, or the other way around two. And firstly, we apply the homography matrix to image one to warp it and resize it and get the matching points with the cropped image, uh, resized image two. And we also do the same to the image two as well and concatenate all the matching points. We found that uh, this method uh, was way better than just uh, warping a single image of a pair, because in some cases, the warped image is too small uh, or very hard to recognize. So um, this method uh, also, uh, improved the score. Next one is the resize trick. Uh, we found that res uh, resizing the images to bigger sizes, bigger sizes um, tends to increase the number of matching points or inlier ratio. So it also helpful, helpful to improve the score, but there's some exceptions uh, in the hard cases. So we chose um, 1080 for the uh, inference size. And then uh, there are like four or five combinations that we use for ensemble. For the model, uh, we use Lofter and DKM. And for method, uh, I just mentioned in the previous slides, I mean, normally we concatenate from number one to number four, but if the number of matching points we found using number four was less than 500, it's too small. So we just concatenate extra matching points using the combination of k-means cropping and warping method. And then we also uh, applied VSEC, which is the state-of-the-art RANSEC framework. Uh, we found that this is much faster than OpenCV MASEC++ and there's tiny increase in private LB score while some decrease in public, public LB score. And because the default parameters of the original repository didn't work properly for the problem, so we just tried to find more um, um, uh, right parameters and uh, uh, with more Python bindings. So this is the parameters that we found. And uh, um, we also can see that on the table that um, the time spent for the inference uh, no, uh, sorry, time spent for uh, applying the method was much faster in WSEC because um, uh, although we used uh, uh, less, uh, the smaller reprojection threshold for WSEC here. Uh, this is the experiment results. Uh, we can see that k-means cropping and warping method contributed the most to the uh, leadable square improvement and resizing method, radius analysis method also improved the score as well. And there's confidence filtering method that I didn't mention in the previous slide that also improved the score, uh, which is um, just filtering out some matching points um, based on the confidence given by the models like Loftor or DKM. Uh, we found this in our uh, private best private LB score case. So these are the methods that we, we can use for folder improvement. Uh, the first one is confidence-based filtering that I just mentioned and adaptive size cropping because we uh, used fixed size cropping in this competition, maybe for uh, better general performance, we can use adaptive size cropping. And then parallel computation to decrease the total amount of time for inference and maybe other models like such as um, call tree attention, for example. But for the summary, by extracting region of interest through k-means cropping, we could obtain more meaningful matching points also, the warping method makes it possible to cope with some edge cases where the two images of a pair were taken from very larger different views. And using VSEC, which is the state-of-the-art VSEC framework, the speed was greatly improved while preserving the score. So the proposed methods, such as cropping and warping, boosted the score with just a couple, uh, just a couple models. Uh, I just listed up the, listed up the note notebooks and discussions that we forward to during the competition. Uh, we uh, a lot of we give a lot of thanks to competition organizers, Kaggle staff, and other participants for giving us this opportunity to learn and grow together. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Questions? Yeah. 
uh, okay in meantime i have questions so it seems that all uh, all solutions and you basically working say we have something initially good and then we try to improve it with cropping and working and so on and like if this fails uh, nobody can like uh, help so, so, so uh, have you to try to do like improve original robustness or it's uh, only the robustness is okay and also the precision of the like lofter is, is not enough that's why you need all to do these uh, improvements we actually uh, didn't did, uh, we actually didn't try to improve the original model. Mm -hmm. We just we just tried to just um, do some post processing. No, no, I understand. I mean, like, what do you mean? Uh, you, like, you improve accuracy and like not robustness. Have you tried to improve robustness by pre-processing? Maybe doing like some test time uh, augmentations. I mean, not based on cropping or matching, but like before just uh, before this like what if you do if there are not enough key points that's the question yeah. i think i think the warping method was the like uh, because the there was the second stage of the the whole met method so mm -hmm. if the number of matching points is too small then we we can use like the the extra met uh, extra warping method or extra cropping method so mm -hmm. i think yeah okay thank you okay, thank you it. Okay, thank you again. So there was one last talk, which was the solution that scored number two, uh, but the presenter declined to participate last minute for some uh, unclear reasons. So we'll just move on with the last uh, uh, session, which is just a uh, small uh, wrap up. Uh, yes, uh, so, so we have learned a lot of lessons. Actually, one thing is, uh, uh, okay, some of those, these lessons were kind of obvious uh, before we begin, but still like, for example, we don't have uh, uh, like compatible train and test set by because of privacy issues like uh, this uh, test that we used like uh, we also were only released basically three image pair because we cannot do this and this is why actually i think nobody used this train test uh, which we released i think only one team like from the high performing using you was using this but not as a testing but as a like validation approach and they make it work somehow but that it uh, requires some work uh, so, so and then, yes, and the question is, uh, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad because not always you can have like huge training set. But how can I approach the thing that uh, there is test set which is uh, comes from, from like very different conditions and you, you cannot train on something on this, and uh, so, so we we don't have any answer for this, and like. Also, it's uh, not clear if it's necessary to actually tune model or or modify. And it seems that uh, all the participants used uh, off-the-shelf networks, which were trained on uh, mega devs, basically, and that's it. Uh, I think there is a only exception was one of the which were used the super glue with uh, disk, which is basically they recreated super glue training pipeline and trained this with disk. And uh, also on mega depths, not, not on uh, other uh, stuff. What is a uh, funny thing is like uh, is prices and licenses. So like it's it's, it's standard uh, requirement from Kaggle and also like from us like that uh, winning solution should be uh, under like uh, very permissive open source license like MIT or Apache too. Uh, and uh, because people uh, wanted to uh, so and there they have a choice either you use uh, super glue and have a little bit better score or you, uh, and you are not eligible unless you're recreated super glue pipeline which is uh, i think uh, so far three independent uh, uh, like implementations failed to uh, have this uh, this score of super glue basically um Yes, and uh, be before, like between money and glory, like the old top team uh, selected glory and say, okay, so we are going to be winner. We don't have any money from this because our solution not eligible, but we would be the best. 
and that's, that, that's like what we were not expecting. I think we, I think we tried to kind of uh, make people like use uh, the open solutions or maybe reimplement things, but it did not happen. Okay, except that just uh, last presented uh, like solution, which is like uh, so, so far we all are reviewing all the solutions and notebooks to like to find out who, who would be actually the, the, the people who get the money because we have to give money, but still we have problems determining who would get. Um, also, the thing is like, is it a correct focus to have only stereo like? Uh, the Kaga has its limitation. You maybe can go around it and somehow build Colma, but then we can have only smaller data set. And there's question, if you have like ideal stereo model, is it good enough for all application? Should we do something uh, to also uh, kind of go for multi-view or actually like as, as uh, Tomasz uh, Malishevich uh, presented or is this paradigm or okay we are just going pairwise and uh, let's drop this uh, key point based approach this is going to win and uh, we don't know and what we wanted actually to do is to like have different methods like uh, also dense methods and actually dense methods were tested i think this uh, deep matching for dense matching from uh, Prontron uh it, it was like evaluated but like it was not as good as lofter so so but at least they they, they tried uh, things like demon and other like pairwise to like output the ball that they, they were not used uh, i don't know if they're like like not competitive or because uh, nobody tried uh so so and that's uh, still an open question actually we have like two open questions and maybe it's a call for uh, uh like your, if your work at some university or company and ha can have some like challenging wide baseline data, which is not public yet, so nobody can fine tune. And if you would like to willing to share this data for new competition, it would be really cool. So we are open to do this. Um, uh, one more thing is uh, like, okay, I, about this pair by thing is is it to make sense to add um, non matchable pairs because for example often it's also good to have not uh, false positive for example if you have like two pairs which not match and the correct output would be like non match like zero matches fine but then also it comes to a kaggle question how do you combine post accuracy and basically binary classification like match no match here do you also have no idea about how to combine this? So if you have fresh idea, please reach us. And I think we are actually thinking about for the next challenge. Uh, I think that uh, concludes our lessons learned. Uh, and um, that's, uh, that is uh, like for the next uh like i have no idea how to properly do hybrid uh hybrid format it, it, it was like uh how things were like we are stupid but uh, how things it's because uh, well it's very stressful and uh, like that's technically no there like many things need to be done differently like completely a uh, person is good completely virtual is also good in a different sense but hybrid like doesn't really work and also for like yeah we have like so schedule we are all over time and we are so, i think a little bit saved but by a couple of video participants who actually send us not 10 minutes but five minute video thanks to them um so Yes. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we are we are really really sorry for having like so such like bad experience and trying to manage something and especially on Zoom. Then okay, the, the sound is not uh, going, video is not going, and uh, like uh, really uh, like we are a uh, very bad organizer. Please forgive us and thank you to be with us here despite all this uh, catastrophe. Yeah.
And uh, that concludes. Uh, I'd like to thank you for participation and uh, enjoy the uh, CVPR. Thank you.